Good afternoon, everyone. This is Dr. James Lyons-Weiler coming to you live from the WWDNYK studios in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. This is the show Unbreaking Science, and i am um, been breaking a hiatus of mine. Coronavirus has taken um, a good amount of my time in terms of research. Uh, we have, let's see, the peer-reviewed publication on pathogenic priming. I've been reviewing vaccine design studies and sending the vaccine makers back to the drawing board to make sure they get those unsafe epitopes out of their vaccines. That's happened twice. I can't tell you which journal. I can't tell you which paper because that's private. But, um, you know, and and of course, I'm enjoying the fact that the, the term pathogenic priming is starting to take hold in uh, the literature being used by other researchers who are concerned about autoimmunity um, being induced by a fairly untested vaccine uh, since they're not looking for disease enhancement in animal studies first. Um, but today I have a really super, super special guest uh, from Ireland. Um, we're, we're going to be speaking with this uh, doctor who is, you know, a very ethical, thoughtful person. Um, and I'm going to let him describe his biography a little bit, but he certainly is a very well-practiced uh, um, GP. Uh, he was nominated to a position on the UK medical, I'm sorry, the, the, the Irish medical board. Um, uh, he's extremely well-researched, extremely well-read uh, and experienced, um, but he also really doesn't want to have people um, confuse where he's coming from with a position of authority. He's coming from this as a humanitarian. He's coming at this issue as a human being. And that's why it is really super to be able to introduce you guys to Dr. Marcus De Bruyne. Is that I pronounce it correctly, De Bruyne? Yeah, that's right. It's the Irish for uh, the Irish for brown. Um, so it is. But yeah, that's 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 correct. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. So what, before we get started, uh, we just go over your biography a little bit so people know where you're coming from. Well, I'm, um, I suppose I, I'm deeply indebted to the United States, I have to say, for the start in my education. I kind of was a high school dropout, and um, I went over to London in the 80s and worked on the, on the building sites in London, and I uh, went to California to, to stay with a girlfriend over there who, um, in order to keep a visa, I had to uh, take some college classes, and uh, I wasn't a fan of academics or education, really. We had such, I suppose, a hard time of it um, in, uh, in in school in Ireland. But uh, I took some classes in the U.S. and then I, I, I went to Sac State in, in in Sacramento, California, and I did uh, science five years, science and English, and then I moved back to Ireland. And I did a degree in microbiology at Trinity College in Dublin. And then after that, I started a master's degree in public health. But I interrupted that to do a medical degree at the Royal College of Surgeons. And following that, I uh, did a couple of years in Irish hospitals. And then I moved with my family to New Zealand um, around 19, around 2005. And uh, I trained to be a general practitioner in the New Zealand system. And became a member of the New Zealand College of General Practice, and then I returned to Ireland and became a member of the Irish College of General Practice. And then um, two years ago, I was nominated to the board of the um, Irish Medical Council. Um, but I suppose I'd have to add to all of that that I don't know uh, what your how your listenership would feel, but I think certainly many people in the general public are probably getting a bit browned off and fed up listening to scientists recite their qualifications and their expertise because I think we've had a bit of an overabundance of, of expertise, some of it good and, and some of it bad. But yeah, for the record anyway, that's that's my background. I totally get that. Thank you for, for, for laying that out for us. But I, I think people don't mind if you have expertise as long as you use it ethically. And I, I, I can certainly vouch for the fact that you, you, you're you using it ethically. You. You resigned from the Irish Medical Council after criticizing mismanagement of the COVID-19 outbreak. And there's a number of criticisms that you had about the, um, the Irish government uh, handling, including a gross overestimation of the case burden, uh, as was in the MSN news story. Um, and But more importantly, uh, it was the um, neglect of the subpopulation at most risk. 
um, specifically the people in care homes, but we call them nursing nursing homes here in the United States. Um, but the nursing home residents uh, themselves, uh, you have a, you were intimately involved and you saw changes in policy. Could you go into what the policy was at first with respect to how to handle the fact that nursing homes were filled with thousands of patients that were, or people that were at higher risk and what the government's disposition was initially and then how that changed? Yeah. Well, I, I suppose, you know, trying to put it in perspective and kind of stepping back and looking at the bigger picture of things is kind of, it's kind of what, what, I, what I was doing. I think what most people were doing is kind of COVID was moving across Europe and uh, coming towards kind of tracking through different countries and coming towards Ireland. We were the, the last country in Europe to essentially um, to, to get COVID. And so we, we, we kind of knew what was coming. had a good idea, as you know, we started out in Wuhan and in, in, well, at least it officially or formally stayed there in December 2019 and then slowly made its, made its way, well, relatively slowly, made its way across, across Europe and arrived in Ireland. Um, and of course, you know, by the time it got here, um, there were certain things that we knew that the dogs on the street knew that everybody knew that the, you know, the overall kind of morty, the, the people who were dying of COVID-19 weren't children, were were you know weren't young healthy adults. The profile was was was, was pretty obvious and pretty um, pretty well publicized <clears throat> at that stage. So by the time it arrived in Ireland, our first case was around February 28th. Um, when we detected our, 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 our first positive case in Ireland and you know so by the time it, it, it arrived we kind of knew what it was going to do you know so we've got a relatively small population of nursing home residents well, what Ireland, you, and what, what you mean by that is that is you, you already knew that there was a linear relationship between the age of a patient and the risk of serious critical illness and death the, the older the patient the higher the risk we already knew that that's what you mean right yeah, absolutely. It wasn't something that I was particularly genius in figuring out. It was all over the internet. You know, it was all over the the, the, the stats were there for, for for the government and for everybody to see. Um so and and indeed when we arrived in Ireland the, the, the government response was the formal response telling people was was to kind of, you know, um, we were instituting lockdown and we were instituting various restrictive measures on the on the population. And the, the government line at the time was, you know, we've got to kind of, you know, help them by, by protecting protect them by protecting ourselves was kind of one of the taglines the government was using. So the the initial um, the initial motivation at the start was to look after the vulnerable, you know, and of course as I said, we've a small population of residents in Ireland with twenty five thousand um, people who live in nursing homes. So you would imagine with a relatively small number of, of nursing home residents that, that the focus is, is going to be on, on those people. Um, specifically for the fact that, you know, not only the fact that COVID affects, you know, or, or the mortality is much higher in the population. Of course, there's the issue of comorbidity and it affects the elderly and the elderly with comorbidity or underlying conditions are going to be the people who are going to be most affected. So in a very obvious sense, in, in all Western society, you find the elderly with comorbidity, well, you find those quite obviously in nursing homes. So you don't need to really be a scientist or, you know, really be a, 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 a hot shot at statistics or anything to figure out where the disease is going to hit and the, who the vulnerable people essentially are. So when it arrived, I suppose, in the, it, when, it, when I started to, to see cases in the nursing home in around March, um, you know, lo lots of things started to emerge in terms of the, the government response that were making me very unhappy and very nervous about how the thing was being managed, I suppose, you know, uh, in, a, in, a, in a rather simplified sense, you know, the, 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 the key things that were happening really was for a, a period of three weeks in our nursing homes, there was a policy of not testing the residents. If you had a nursing home in Ireland where you had a case, then you weren't permitted to test any more residents because we were worried about a shortage of testing. So yeah. that was the first kind of policy that was very, very, very reckless. And whilst that was going on, that went on from kind of March 
um, March 21st until kind of April uh, 19th, so for about a, a three-week period. But um, that policy was instituted, and then during that, that time, because there was such a panic and such a fear in the general public, the, and we saw those horrific pictures of Italy and the, the coffin trucks and the morgues being overfilled. There was a huge sense of evolving panic in Ireland. So the government, you know, perhaps rightly or wrongly, tried to clear out the hospitals and anybody who was kind of in a, in a, in a satisfactory state or a recovering state um, with reasonable help was sent to the nursing homes sector. Um, to recuperate, and any available beds in the nursing home were kind of um, occupied by hospital patients to free up hospital space. So, in my particular nursing home that I look after, we'd 50, I had 52, 53 residents there, um, and the, the hospital started, but we had a lot of capacity because it's a newly built facility, so we have a lot of empty beds. So, the government it kind of transferred about 15 um, patients from our local hospital. And as these patients were, were arriving, I only kind of realized into about four or five days or a week or so into the process that none of these residents, none of these patients being transferred from the hospital had been tested and, and some of them were symptomatic. So there was a kind of a, 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 a policy to preserve tests um, for the, 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 the majority of people in the population and withhold the tests from the elderly in the nursing homes and from people who were, you know, symptomatic being transferred into them. What we were told was if somebody arrives in your nursing home and they're symptomatic, we'll just quarantine them in, in their own room for, for, for two weeks. So the, all of this kind of stuff, and then we had difficulties trying to get PPE, huge difficulties trying to get PPE, trying to get extra oxygen supplies because, you know, we were told, you know, I was told and all the doctors in, in looking after nursing homes we were told, well, look, try to get DNR or do not resuscitate status established for the residents so that you're not unnecessarily sending um, residents with, into the hospital to be resuscitated if they're in a kind of a end of life care situation where you and the family and the resident themselves agrees that they don't want to go in and have, you know, the electrodes, the jump leads attached to their hearts and the, the ambulance, all of that sort of thing. So so the government was asking us to put this DNR status in place for residents and, and you know, we're happily doing this, but I, I, I say to the management... But, 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 with, but with the patient's and the family's consent. Of course. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it would only be something that, that was done unlike, very, very un, 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 unlike, unlike we now know is going on in New York City hospitals where they were giving people DNRs even though the family did not consent. Oh yeah, well I mean you, you, America obviously you've got a huge, you've got some huge bigger issues there in terms of the relationship between public and private sector and the relationship between uh, profits and, and, and health care and that yeah. sort of thing. You know things are relatively more simple and I don't mean that in a kind of a superior way or anything but relatively more simple in a socialist kind of a system that we have where kind of you know health care is, 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 it's not we don't have that uh, degree, I suppose. Of, of, of yeah, I just, I just want to repeat for my listeners that you, you that you guys did get consent from the family and the patient if they were able to get those DNRs. That's an important issue. Here. Oh, there's absolutely. A, there's there, what, the, where this is coming from, Marcus, is that there were some nurses that came out, whistleblower nurses that came out at expense of their own careers, and and they said that they are inflating the number of deaths of coronavirus. Uh, by making sure that people die with coronavirus uh, by giving them DNRs just because they're unconscious and the, 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 the family didn't have anything to say about it. It's, it's, oh, look, it's lots of that I think went on. Yeah, definitely lots of that went on. I mean, even in even in Ireland, I'm not kind of you know big enough our socialism, but you know even in Ireland, the nursing home sector itself. I mean, nursing homes in Ireland are are private entities, and that's part of the reason. That, that, that they ran into so much difficulties and that they had a somewhat antagonistic relationship with the state because as far as the state is concerned, private entities like nursing homes should be buying their own PPE and should be. So there was a little bit of kind of that, you know, um, um, holding on to the goodies themselves and not giving it to the nursing homes because they were supposed to buy it themselves. And there was a little bit of that if the nursing homes were, had cases of COVID that were dying, then they would get a certain degree of the COVID funding and COVID money. So, you know, I think as time progresses in probably all jurisdictions, 
this relationship between the emergency COVID funding that came into place in every country probably in, in, in the world that has had COVID, government has instituted emergency funding. So I would imagine as time goes by, the, the, the influence of those funding structures on all countries will probably expose some pretty nasty stuff. But yeah. the, the, the main kind of thing about the DNRs was, was that I was doing the DNRs in, in good faith or, or, or talking to families in good faith. But when I went to the management in the nursing home and said, listen, we, if we're going to have people dying here in, in, in larger numbers, then we need to get some oxygen, uh, extra oxygen supplies, you know, just so they can die with dignity. I mean, we can, right. couldn't get respirators and things like that, but extra oxygen. But things like that, like we couldn't get extra oxygen. The gas company are telling the manager at the nursing home that you've got to give us back an empty tank before we give you another one. So we're kind of in this bizarre situation where we, where I really felt that the state had kind of abandoned us in the nursing home, abandoned the elderly in the nursing home, depriving them of you know, basic things like testing or, or, you know, like the access to testing or testing the, the people who have been dumped into the nursing home. So this was part of the whole kind of mess. I mean, I suppose, crucially, in the middle of whilst this is all going on, I'm returning to my surgery because I have a, a, a clinic that I run. And so in my clinic, I'm following the state guidelines to give the testing to the general public. And, you know, I've got people calling me up, you know, with a runny nose and out doing their and, you know, according to our guidelines and criteria, well, these people, if they've any kind of a general little cough or a little symptom, they're entitled to testing. So I'm putting these people, the general public, on the register for testing. And whilst I'm trying to put the elderly in the nursing home when I really need it, I'm trying to figure out who's got it, who doesn't, whose family am I going to ring, DNRs, all of that the people that I'm putting on the, the list for testing in the nursing homes, they're actively getting booted off the test by the by the testing center because of this policy that we can't test uh, more than one resident at a nursing home. If you have it, you just assume everybody has it. So these very inhumane things were going on, and that's kind of what triggered my resignation from the, the medical council in Ireland because I, I, I I really felt, you know, disgusted about what was going so, on. So. so, so let's be clear. What happened was initially the the nursing homes were more or less shut down to new residents, right? There was a policy that it, they, yeah. they had closed doors. I think you, that was in March or or, or late March. Uh, That's right. Yeah. New dates, and then early they changed, March. Interact, yeah, maybe. And then they changed it and they opened up the nursing homes to allow new patients in, knowing that there is coronavirus resident. In those nursing homes. Not so much new right. patients. They allowed, they did close the doors, but when they closed the doors, they closed the doors to visitors and the general public. Okay. And they, they, whilst that was going on, the doors were always open to transfers from the hospital. I mean, remember, I suppose they were trying to keep the acute hospitals clear. So they were transferring, recovering patients from the acute hospitals into beds, available beds in the nursing home sector. So you'd have people with a broken arm or something and they were just kind of, you know, waiting to get better um, before they were going home. So relatively healthy patients were coming out of the hospital and being transferred into the nursing home. But some of those were symptomatic for COVID-19 and they weren't they weren't tested. There was no facility to test these residents so or these patients coming from the hospital. So essentially they brought COVID uh, into the nursing home. I mean, my nursing home, as I said, took in about 14 or 15, but there's another nursing home in my town um, that's managed by another GP or another doctor, and that nursing home is at full capacity and didn't take any hospital transfers. Now, that nursing home had no from COVID, and in my own nursing home, we had 15 out of the 50 residents, we 15 die of COVID in the space of, of, of eight weeks. And it was um, it was pretty horrific stuff. You know, it was kind of like a war setting where you're kind of going in and out every day and you're encountering people. I mean, usually I might have one or two or, or three residents in the course of a kind of a year period just, you know, die of expected deaths. But to have that concentration in the space of eight weeks was was pretty um, horrific stuff. It probably unhinged me a little bit at the time, maybe, I don't know. But certainly it wasn't a nice uh, it wasn't a nice place to be. And certainly we at least died nursing staff, of course, felt very left out of the of the management, the police management strategy. So it certainly caused some cognitive dissonance on your part to make you say, hey wait a minute, the, the, this policy is wrong. You saw patients coming in that had 
uh, symptoms and were probably positive that could infect patients and staff. And you also probably saw patients come in that didn't have COVID-19 symptoms that developed COVID-19 because it was resident in that closed community. Um, so let's talk about the Medical Council. It's made up of 25 people. There's 13 that were lay people and, seven, and 12 that, that were, were medical. It actually has a statutory role, according to the article, in protecting the public by promoting the highest professional standards. I'm reading right from the MSN News story. Among doctors practicing in the Republic of Ireland, today the Medical Council confirmed Dr. Marcus Bruns resignation. Now, this happened a while ago which it said was for personal reasons. But there was also another person who they resigned about the same time and then they said that she resigned um, because of uh, health, for health reasons. Was her resignation in any way related to these issues that you know of? Well, you know, it, it, it may or may not have been. I don't point to her in particular. You know, right. the Medical Council, my resignation, I made it perfectly clear to the Medical Council that I was resigning not for personal reasons. I was resigning because the, the, that the, the, the human beings, the elderly people in the nursing home um, sector, you know, were being grossly uh, abused and, neglected, and neglected, right? you know, sure. and, 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 and that's why I resigned. But they, they of course, get a, the public statement that I was resigning for, for personal reasons because, you know, in Ireland and, and probably in many countries, institutions are like the Medical Council is very much tied into the government. The government, you know, is, is responsible for a good degree of its funding and its appointments to the Medical Council and the Medical Council would have a close relationship with the minister as such, you know, so um, my criticisms certainly um, were described, I suppose, as, as for personal reasons, but that's just more of a political description, I suppose. You know? Yeah, of course, of course, we expect these euphemisms from, from such a yes, position, yes. Um, the CYA approach. So the, your other concern about this was the deaths from COVID-19 were being intermingled with deaths with COVID-19, and that certainly is widespread. I mean, there's no distinction in the final tally that, that I've seen, and, and public health policies were based on you know, the infection rates based on, on symptomatic diagnoses, uh, you know, I'm sorry, the, the death rates were, uh, you know, initially very high because of, of the, the, the way that they were being calculated. And when you have the infection rate, say in the United States, we now know from the CDC, uh, you know, molecular test positive infection case fatality rates is 0.26%. That's a very different situation population-wide than you see for the elderly populations. And I commend you substantially uh, and, and for standing up for that, for that population. My 500,000 foot view, if you will, here is that COVID-19, this virus has stressed all of our systems and all of the all of the problems that we see with them are kind of cartoonish, exaggerated realities that are already already exist. Right, the nursing home is a place where people expect that you probably you might not come back out, right? And it, it, the compression of these deaths over time, and I want to get into you, in, in this with you as well because I know you have an opinion on it. But when we do the lockdown. We're compressing the deaths that were likely to occur anyway in a short period of time. You brought up the number of deaths in eight weeks, as opposed to what would happen in a you know more natural way where there's not a vaccine. And you're very clear about this in your article, which I'll post on the comments so people can go read it. It's a beautiful article. That the number of deaths that would occur are likely to be about the same, but they would be slower over time. And so in the name of protecting the, the medical system from being overwhelmed by a surge, they kind of created a surge, in, right? In, in, ironically, they created a surge by panicking um, over the sort, shortage of, of, of goods and supplies, materials, PPEs, oxygen, and so on. Um, but the, 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 the rationale of a lockdown um, is that someday there's going to be a vaccine, right? That, that, that we would hope would be able to protect people, including those in nursing homes in the long run. However, there's no guarantee. It's been stated over and over by our public health officials like Dr. Anthony Fauci. Um, but the, what, what, a, what, what the lockdown was supposed to be, as I understood, explained to us in the United States anyway, was we need time to get the medical community ready to line up the PE, PPEs and stock up on oxygen and make sure we have enough beds and so on. 
And then it kind of through mission creep just shifted to, well, nothing's going to change. We're no new normal until there's a vaccine, which is holding society hostage, in my view. Mm. Um, but if you look at the total number of deaths that are likely to occur over time, it's, it's understood that it would be the same number of deaths that would occur just over a shorter, uh, slower as, as over, over a longer period of time than compressing them all into a short period of time. Um, and, and, and the benefit, the, 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 the cost of a lockdown is that we don't achieve herd immunity uh, as soon as we would if the virus were to spread through the population. And so there's a trade off. And use the, the bad word <laughs> herd uh, immunity. <laughs> well, I mean, I know the, I know the mathematical function of the, you know, how to calculate herd immunity. And, and you use yeah. it too in your article. So go ahead, explain your view on herd immunity in here. Oh no! I mean, I, I what, when I say you used a bad word in terms of herd immunity, you know, I, I'm of the uh, of the belief and of the opinion that never has there been uh, 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 an error of nomenclature in the history of science that has resulted in such catastrophic misinterpretation by the general public of how nature works. You yeah. know, this this word herd. You know, is, it has unfortunately, I think, done more damage to the appropriate management and interpretation of how nature works. You know, I mean, as soon as it came out, as soon as as soon as as, as Ferguson and, and as soon as it came out in the UK that uh, that this there was a thing, a magical thing called herd immunity. Well, I mean, the public went mad. You know, the you know the the word herd. You know, it conjures up images that were going to be treated like animals. Animals and, and you know Nietzsche referred to the the rabble as the herd. You know, yeah. I mean, it's it's yeah. it's a horrible word, and and unfortunately, you know, unfortunately, policy in many respects in many countries was dictated really by you know by public opinion. You know, so so at, right. the minute this term came out, herd immunity, it did it has done more damage, I think, to to the public understanding of what's going on. And it's created more enemies to nature than one could have ever, ever imagined. So I think when history looks back at this process, the simple nomenclature itself of herd immunity will be certainly cited and recognized as one of the most damaging parts of this entire process, just because of the effect that it's had on the herd, on, on people I, in general. I couldn't agree more because in, in Ebola, we were told that there were going to be 21 million deaths in Africa by January 2015. And then a postdoctoral, well, a faculty at, at Yale who was, a, who, who was a, a graduate student that I knew in evolutionary biology named Jeff Townsend kind of tapped the CDC on the shoulder and said, well, I've done some modeling here. You guys forgot that Ebola travels in social units. It does, it's not a random bronium motion model, right? It's not just everybody's equally likely to expose to other people. And that kind of heterogeneous risk of infection is never built into our concept when we use the word herd immunity. You know, like we're cattle out on the uh, out, out in the pasture just randomly bumping into each other in a brownian motion yeah. model. And, and that made the same mistake here too. And the, the modeling that got that was so so wrong that no one could reproduce out of those spreadsheets from uh, from the UK. That's you know was his name McPherson or something. That that uh, all this modeling that was so so far off. Um, yeah. I did some modeling on my own, and I said specifically when I broadcast my videos of the modeling, that don't look at the upper numbers. I'm not talking about the number upper numbers. I was trying to teach the epidemiology that the concept of what happens. And what, how different factors influence the shapes of the curves. But by no means did I ever stand by the, you know, the upper number because I didn't even have a sigmoidal model. I was just using an exponential model. But uh, so if we built in a different term, well, politically here in the United States, they want to call it community immunity. And that's all kind of warm and fuzzy. That's all warm and fuzzy, <laughs> community immunity. Uh, in reality, it's a bit like freedom fries when you reinvented the French fry and you came up with freedom <laughs> fries. I mean, but that's yeah, kind of exactly. gone now, isn't it? Yeah, it's totally gone. Anymore. Nobody, nobody calls them freedom fries. Trust me. Well, maybe, maybe natural immunity might have been a, a better thing, but there's no two ways about it. The, the notion yeah. of herd immunity has done more damage. You know, to to I mean, you know, I mean, I, I would imagine most of your listeners or most people would know 
that you acquired immunity or natural immunity is. You know, I mean, it's it's essentially you know when we've got the the common cold virus and it comes around every year and it hits the population. You know, it's 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 it affects people and people you know get the cold and then they become they clear it and they develop antibodies to it and they have a degree of immunity to it. And that process builds in a population, and maybe it's somewhere between 50 and 60 percent become immune, having had the cold and relatively minor symptoms. And as more people become infected, then the chances of the virus being able to spread within a population is decreased, obviously, right. because every time the virus meets a new potential host, well, you know, 50 percent of, of, of the population is, is immune, so the virus can't spread. So it's Mother Nature's way, it's basic kind of. The science's way of dampening down, not just not dampening down, in fact, of getting rid of the virus. But I think when you, when you factor in her, the development of herd immunity and you factor that into prolonged daylight, because as we all know, UV light kills viruses, it's not conspiracy. So when you factor in uh, herd immunity or natural immunity in a population and increase in daylight, well, then you see the, the empirical reality of the virus disappearing out of a population when it comes to the summer you don't see cold virus i don't treat people with colds and flus generally speaking in the summer um so it goes so it's it's mother nature the 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 process the global or larger process of viral evolution within a population and developing immunity and natural right. daylight and and when when we institute things like lockdown well, we, we're having this rather homocentric conversation with Mother Nature, thinking that we can kind of somehow control all of these forces. Perhaps we can influence them, but all we can do with lockdown is just simply try and dampen down the virus and try and kind of keep the virus at, at low levels. But it's a dangerous thing to do for, for obvious reasons, because if you preserve a virus in the community, the longer you preserve it for, well, you give the virus the, the opportunity to do what all living things do, which is evolve. So, you know, it's a fun, there's a fundamental kind of ludicrous and idiotic kind of a notion to the lockdown scenario where you're preserving a virus in a population, giving it the popul giving it the opportunity to evolve, and then telling people that, well, look, you know, we'll all be fine until the vaccine comes. But, you know, I mean, I, I do understand COVID evolves relatively slowly. But nonetheless, the basic concept of keeping the virus in the community until a vaccine comes, you know, it's, 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 it's dangerous. Unheard of. It's unheard of. It's unprecedented. Oh, it's, it, it's, a it's a sociological, pol political, psychological, you know, mass hypnosis experiment that absolutely has no precedent anywhere. Anywhere. Well, no. In the history of humanity, and and we look at oh, exactly. we look at Fauci, and we look at CDC, and we look at the NIH, and we look at our public health leaders, and we say, okay, we will we will do what we have to do because you promised me a better future than I have right now. But they don't realize people that fall for that don't realize that the reason why your presence is, is so is, is so miserable is because the decision to lockdown, which was supposed to be a short term lockdown. The only time I supported the lockdown was under this condition. We do it for a couple of weeks, let the medical community get their sh get their shit together. Then we introduce antivirals prophylactically at the points of contact of people that have been in contact and we use hydro hydroxychloroquine. I was among the first people to list it. In my blog article, we use hydroxychloroquine. We use anything that's available. We enhance the immune system with vitamins. Anything, you know, anything that might help but won't hurt, right? Yeah. And then we systematically go about, okay, you, 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 you have been exposed. You have been cleared. You've done your time. Why should people have to do their time over and over and over again simply because there's something, you know, circulating and we, we can't afford it. It was intuitive to me that we can't afford it. And we can't afford it, not just in terms of monetary, but we can't afford it in terms of the deaths of despair. We can't afford it in terms of the destruction of the economy, the loss of, of uh, relationships in the workplace, the loss of small businesses, all of it. And, and everybody's keenly aware that this is completely unsustainable. And yet, even now, we have, at least in the United States, this mentality, we're given this mentality, we're handed down this mentality that we're supposed to swallow hook, line, and sinker that 
Well, you know, just wait en enough months, um, you know, and, and we'll have a vaccine. The first time that they said that was 18 months. When was the last time we shut down our entire economy for 18 months? I mean, there's really something fundamentally wrong with the brain that speaks that those words. We're going to just keep you in lockdown for 18 months. It doesn't add up. And there's something terribly, terribly wrong with that thinking. No, look, there, there definitely is something terribly, terribly wrong with with thinking as a, 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 at the moment. You know, my wife is reading a, a fantastic book at the minute. It's um, oh, I forget the name now, but it's by a recent Pulitzer Prize winner, and it's about the migration of Black America from the South after slavery, um, the migration into kind of North America, and kind of explaining how kind of you know the evolution of racism and the evolution of black ghettos and, and the evolution of the race problem itself in the US. Now, she sometimes kind of, you know, while she's reading, when we're in bed, she, she, she let a shout out, oh my God, that explains everything, you know? But, <laughs> you know, I, I, was thinking to, I was thinking the other day when she was just saying, uh, uh, telling me a little bit about the book, you know, I was thinking, isn't it very, very strange, you know, if, if we go back to kind of, you know, um, um, the difficulties that, uh, with race that you had in America, you know, um, in terms of, you know, having this notion that, you know, black people are completely, they're inferior to white people and they're unevolved and that they can't sit in the same coffee shop and they can't kind of send their kids to the same school. Now, the point that I'm essentially making is, is that throughout history, we've had these ridiculous, these kind of crazy situations where human logic or human common sense or even basic morality, whether you're a Christian or a Buddhist or a Hindu or whatever, but just basic moral principles of kind of humanitarianism and of kind of basic logic like saying that a black man is inferior to a white man because he's got different I mean it takes an awful lot of kind of mental gymnastics to kind of get yourself into the zone where you buy into kind of crazy rhetoric like kind of inferiority of people because of color or you know yeah. or even when you look at the Nuremberg rallies and you know putting people in ovens and all of that you know the horrific things have gone on in human history and it seems to me that every time we kind of try and evaluate that we evaluate it from a kind of a, 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 a an almost nuanced modern perspective of what's right and what's wrong but it seems to me that the, the deeper question is 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 how do human beings get on a mass level to get their basic kind of morals and basic thinking hijacked, you know, into kind of crazy beliefs where his, it takes them like 50 years or 100 years for historians to come back and then we all feel very good and very good. We, we look at these horrible say to ourselves, oh my God, I would never put you know, Jewish people into ovens and I would never kind of want to wipe people out because they're handicapped. I, and, and we feel good about ourselves with this contemporary moral view that we might have looking back at history, you know. Right, right. But I would imagine history, COVID is a little bit of a game changer, I think, because history will look back at us again. And history will say, oh my God, those idiots. Like, how could you possibly negate Mother Nature, UV light, herd immunity, a basic kind of principles of science. How could you negate all of that? How can you have people driving in their cars with masks on? And how could you preserve a virus in society and allow people to kind of, you know, buy into all of this? But I would imagine it's going to be for the Europeans to look back. But the, the crazy thing is, is why do we always kind of get the common sense, have to wait 50 years, common sense view to kind of why isn't there kind of people who are like why am I a minority I know maybe I'm a bit wacky and maybe you are too Jack I don't know but you know why is it that you know when we're yeah. talking a little bit of sense old-fashioned science just common basic I mean you made a distinction on one of your podcasts between kind of um, you know basic science and 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 uh, practical science you know but like the the basic science here of kind of nature how things evolve, you know, that's kind of, you know, that's high school biology stuff. It's not, well, I mean, I know it may not be taught in all high schools, but, you know, any kind of high school kid or, or basic guy on the street could get his head around what we're talking about. So my, my question is, the thing I can't understand is, is that why are we going to have to wait 50 years 
for a kind of history to come out and say, oh, yeah, they were all so stupid back in the 20s. Can you believe what they did? You know? Absolutely. I'm a fan of history um, because that's where we learn how stupid we can be, right? And, and I don't distinguish myself from people in the past. I don't distinguish our society from people in the past. And, and that leads me to the, 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 the kind of low bar that we set for ourselves on these issues. You brought up some horrific things, the racism in the United States, Nazism, anti-Semitism. The, the sad part about all of that is that when we think about these things, so many of us simply say, it's, that's human nature. That's part of us. That's part of who we are. And the, this, this systemic hijacking of t entire populations to believe something that is patently false right in front of their face through the social pressure of acceptance uh, uh, with, the, with the promise of a big payoff, there's a whole lot of psychological tricks going on. There's psyops for sure. Um, and uh, part of it is, I think, the big industries that make money hand over fist, like the, the, the GSK is going to charge $2,500 for remdesivir. That's criminal. right? After they knocked out hydroxychloroquine, now that they have a monopoly, okay, now it's a rare commodity, we're going to do remdesivir. They have figured out in a very substantial way that in a battle with reason, their capitalist tendencies, and I'm not a communist by any means, but their capitalistic tendencies, which we all have, win in a stalemate. They don't have to win. They don't have to vaccinate everybody, 100% of people in the population, and thereby injure every single person in the population that might be injured by a particular vaccine. They, 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 all they have to do is confuse the public long enough for them to set up a new policy and say, okay, well, that's the new policy or that's the law. This is how it's done. And, and it all changed, as you probably remember, in 1986 when Western medicine prior to 1986, well, 1980s, I don't know about your country, but uh, um, it was illegal for profiting out of medical care. You're supposed to break even. It was supposed to be a not-for-profit situation. Once the profit motive took over, everything changed. Everything changed. And, and it, this idea of quality of life years, well, I'm going to invest more, and it's related to your nursing home situation. I think it explains it. Uh, the accountants tell us that if you put more into, say, a five-year-old, put more, spend seventy-five thousand dollars saving the life of a five-year-old, you're going to get another seventy years on return on investment. As opposed to a seventy-five-year-old, you might get another fifteen or ten. Well, that's not a good investment. And once you commoditize human life, it exonerates the, the immediate decision makers at that point in time, and they say that's the policy. And it's related to the greater good concept, which doesn't apply in any individual greater, right? The greater good concept. We all want to think that we're good acting individuals, that our, 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 our lifestyle, our choices, our decisions are not going to hurt another person, in, even indirectly. I would hate to think that the fact that I'm drinking this particular brand of coffee, you know, is, is putting somebody out in a third world country. But I'm sure that it is. Right, in some yeah. way, there's some up, up, there's seven degrees of separation on that or something. But if 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 we look at our fundamental nature of humanity, we say, how do they get us to act like this? They did it out of fear. They, fear is the greatest weapon against the truth, and you can motivate almost anyone to do almost anything out of fear. Uh, the positive reinforcement has to be there as well, where you say, okay, listen, the payoff is in the future, we'll have this vaccine. After systematically giving the vaccine as an answer to this. And so we don't, we're talking about COVID-19, but there are other things that we can talk about. For instance, if we know that antivirals might have, early, early on, might have been useful in shutting down transmissions in places where people were at high risk of serious illness and mortality, and that's how I think they should be used early, prophylactically, then why don't we use the same kind of technique in other, for other pathogens, right? Why don't we think about it in terms of, well, we have a measles outbreak in a high school, we're going to prophylactically protect people, you know, by upping their vitamin D, you know, there's none of that kind of forward thinking. Um, and systems biology tells us that you're exactly right, but sociology also tells us that the, the, the sickness that, that takes over a society, that took over Nazi Germany, the sickness that exists that says, 
I'm going to be better off if that entire group of people over there, whether they're blacks or, or Jewish people, if they're exterminated, I'm going to be better off um, in some way. That's endemic to our species in a way. And, and, and the fact, the sad fact is that, that we accept that it's endemic to our species and we don't try to purge that instead. Uh, and in the current context, not to go too far afield, but in the current context, the, the systematic warping of science and medicine by politicians and by people with profit agendas. Politicians should stay out of this debate. There's no way in hell that Trump should have any opinion about any of this. He should have said, I'm going to leave this to the scientists and the medical experts and let them work it out. He should have facilitated discussions between scientists and medical experts. Instead, what we have is, you know, two-faced Fauci telling us one thing one week and telling us the, the exact opposite the next because a stalemate confusion allows them to enact whatever policies they want. Can't get, people can't keep up. I couldn't keep up. It's like this uh, psychological whiplash, this an, an intellectual whiplash. And so um, if, if we can get to the point where we do not accept that basal part of us, which I think evolutionarily comes from the fact that we are the last remaining species of the homo genus, that we exterminated anybody that didn't look like us, the village, you know, the tribalism. It's really tribalism. Now, this is going to blow your mind, Marcus. Why did the medical community say that they needed the PPEs and they, they needed to get their stuff together first, that they should have the masks, they should have the gloves, they should have the protection, they should be able to shut down their entire industry when their sworn legacy, their sworn duty to society is to save human lives and to risk their own doing it if necessary, to, to save lives, to first do no harm and save lives. That's tribalism. The people in the white coat. That, there's tribalism there big time. And I've heard people say, stop wearing masks, stop wearing gloves, save it for us because I care about my people. These are medical people saying this. I care about my people. They put themselves first and they still haven't opened up. And, you know, you know a lot about the, the problems that happen when you shut down a medical system <laughs> and you don't do cancer screens, right? You don't do any cancer yeah. screening. You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, well, you know, I, I, I suppose, you know, there's, there's a lot of things there in, in what you've said, you know, and I would agree with you, with perhaps most of it, you know. Um, certainly, I, I think, you know, COVID-19 is a, is, a, is a game changer. It's a game changer for philosophy, and it's a game changer for science, and it's a game changer for politics, you know. It's, it certainly is, and, and it has to be, you know. But I think, you know, getting down, getting, drilling into the kind of the core issues that have been exposed here, what the kind of the dirty kind of underbelly of science, the dirty underbelly of politics, and the dirty old underbelly of us, we the people, you know, uh, in terms of our kind of propensity to follow the herd and kind of talk, we do what we're told, which is in some respects is a good thing, but to not kind of think independently and analyze things. But I think if we're if if we're getting into that zone, if we're, where we're kind of looking at this in a deep and honest way, then we have to ask what motivates all of us, motivates human beings in general. What is it that we're trying to achieve when we're kind of putting other people in ovens or, or you know, killing off the old people in the nursing homes? You know, what, what are the kind of deeper instinctual imperatives that kind of drive the human being? And I think science and evolutionary biology has never really gotten its head around that. We have this kind of bizarre bucket we call instinct. You know, and we say that there's an instinct to dominate or an instinct to eat and an instinct to have sex and all of this sort of stuff, you know, and then behavior comes out of these instincts, you know. But I think we have to bring it back when we're looking at what's going on with COVID and our reaction and the mistakes we made, you know, we have to bring it right back to what most motivates us. You know, I mean, I'm a doctor. I'm, I'm working in, in, in Ireland. I, I pay a lot of tax. I pay 51% is, is the tax bracket that I pay. But having said that, I make a lot of money. You know, I make too much money. I make more more than what I need, you know. And, mm -hmm. you know, I'm a product of the of the capitalist society, you know, and I drive a nice car and I live in a nice house and I enjoy all the things that my money gives me. 
But at the end of the day, I make more than what I need, you know. And, and this basic kind of conversation, because we're talking about money, that's a universal. Almost everybody in a capitalist society or a social society wants to make money, wants to commit, wants a good salary and all the rest of it. But, you know, that fundamental concept of how much is enough, what do we want, what's kind of driving academia, education, politics. Well, money is certainly a big, big issue. But the conversation, it always kind of shifts to the other people's money, the vaccine makers and the politicians. Money. But, you know, our own kind of fundamental sense of what we need to live in tune with nature, our kind of, our, our basic needs, having a nice home, having a one car, having, you know, living within our means, you know, is it, it, a very, very reasonable, if not entirely sophisticated and evolved philosophy. And the absence of that, the absence of being able to kind of rationally approach our needs, what we actually need, you know, that causes a, a huge number of problems in our society. And then we kind of are at the stage where we're on the outside of those problems, looking at them and tipping away at them and everything, but we're not addressing kind of the fundamental drive that we have ourselves to hoard to make as much money as we can, to allay our fears of the world by having a large amount of money in the bank, you know. And this is very primitive sort of thinking on our part because science, technology, reason, mass production has all kind of have brought the Western world to a point where we can actually live very, very comfortable, happy, sophisticated, minimal, educated lives with, with if we effort. kind of reevaluated yeah. this notion of kind of, you know, how much we need and hoarding things and owning things, you know. So, you know, I think COVID has kind of exposed some deep philosophical things. And, and you know, the argument that, 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 that you were making there about the vaccine, you know, I mean, you had in the U.S., you had your election, you got the Trump was elected, you know, and, 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 and then after the fact it comes out that just Cambridge Analytics and people were on the media kind of manipulating in order to get uh, Trump elected and he had people in, in whatever, you know, uh, in manipulating social media. But, you know, we have to ask ourselves, if we're developing kind of two, got two or three companies developing a vaccine that's going to be given to literally billions of people, you know, the amount of money that's involved in that process is absolutely mind-blowing. It's, it's, yes. it's in the realm of, of billions and billions and billions. But to kind of be, have this naive notion that this is all going on for the greater good and that there's no influence social media and that minds aren't being and opinions aren't being manipulated through you know, through Facebook and lockdown and the, and the idea of having a lockdown until we get a vaccine, you know, it's very difficult to disentangle, you know, capitalist, you know, uh, agenda at, from that, given that there's so, so much money involved in it. But, you know, instead of perhaps us looking at the corporation and saying, oh, these guys are evil and that sort of thing, you know, maybe we all need to be having a deeper dialogue with ourselves. Because if we were all, if I was to turn around and maybe have faith in my government and have faith in the taxes that they weren't spending it on, on, on bombs and, and crazy shit, if I could have faith in my government and didn't object to my taxes and maybe let them tax me a little bit more and we had social investment, but I, in order to do that, I was saying to myself, well, Marcus, you know, you don't need to make as much as you do. You don't need to hoard all of these things. You've only got another 20 or 30 years left and you're dead. So what's the point in it anyway? But I, I, the point I suppose I'm trying to make is, is I think we need a deeper dialogue with ourselves as a kind of individuals in the Western world. Because we've got the science, we've got mass, we've got the capabilities. For God's sake, we can send people to the moon and aircraft carriers yeah. to the Gulf. We can actually construct a society if, if, if we could stop hoarding. I mean, this notion that somebody should be making $10 million a year and should be making $100 a year and like Bill Gates is on a billion whatever dollars a year. I mean, what the hell are they doing with all that shit? You know, I mean, I went into the supermarket the other day and I, and I was greeted right at the front of the supermarket with a 49, 49 cent vegetable kind of island. I got lemons and I got courgettes and I put them in my trolley and then I push it around the corner and I see a free range chicken. Now, maybe it's not free range, maybe it's poison, I don't know. But I got a free range chicken and I put all it into the trolley and I have about, you know, 
eight or nine euros worth of food there, and I have enough to feed my family for two or three days. And it's I took no effort. Home, we cook, it took no we cook the chicken. The following day, we make a risotto out of the chicken. I got the lemons with my kids, and we're squeezing the lemons, and we make fresh lemonade, and we're all hanging out together, having a good time for ten bucks. And I'm thinking to myself, why? Why do people have like? Hundreds and hundreds of millions. Like, why does Tom? This is during a pandemic. You could do this. Money. You could do this during a pandemic too. I wanted to point out you're in the midst of the worst pandemic ever, right? So, right. So, listen. You're, yeah. you you beautifully put it that we need to have a more fundamental co conversation. And social psychology is a good place to turn to about how it is that people follow the group. Why do people follow the crowd? And that was kind of the context we were talking about. And you know, uh, there, there's. Certainly, once someone is sufficiently afraid, they just want someone to tell them what to do because they're afraid of making the wrong decision for themselves and for their family. They literally don't want to own that liability, that responsibility. And there's a psychological protection because, well, you know, I have to do it because it's the law. Or, you know, and the people that have made those decisions and still take on this psychological kind of liability of some harm coming to their loved one because they followed the rules, they followed the law. That's a very difficult thing for them to ever let go of. But, you know, Alfred North Whitehead said that civilization advances by extending the number of operations we can perform without thinking about them. That, that's what our species kind of is. We're like, we're like experts at efficiency. We're experts at doing the most work possible with the fewest number of steps, exerting the fewest number of calories. And so... If you combine this need for efficiency, then people want simple solutions. They want simple explanations. Sometimes there's not a simple explanation. But you mentioned biases in our pregame discussion. You said you hope you don't have any biases. Every human being on the planet has biases by definition. We're all subjective individuals, including um, Anthony Fauci, including the public health leaders in the UK and in, in Ireland. Um, the reason why people tend to go along and conform with the group is more than just that they want to fit in. We're kind of hardwired by our genetics to follow the path of least resistance because resistance that we meet will be physiologically, economically, psychologically expensive. Mm -hmm. We're lazy. It's laziness that why people won't read. Like for my autism book, I read 2,000 studies. Who does that? That was a yeah. huge amount of work that I had to put in. Why? Because I wanted answers. I wanted answers because I th thought it was time that somebody actually consume literature knowing that very few scientists, even at the cutting edge in a particular discipline, actually are aware of all the research that's going on around them. They're kind of aware of what will get their next grant funded. They're justifying their next grant or the bridge money. So we're not always in control of our thoughts and our behavior. Sometimes our thoughts are definitely taken over by other people. I'm not talking about thought control like a conspiracy theorist. I'm talking about influencing of what we're doing right now. I'm influencing people's thoughts. You're influencing people's thoughts. Uh, we give those, those control of our thoughts and our decision making over to people within the context of a close relationship. I don't know Anthony Fauci, but I talk to him every day. Right. I hear him on the news every day. There are spouses that hear more from Anthony Fauci than they hear from each other. And we give over the kind of a locus of control of what we believe to those around us. Well, he's not around us. He's over in Washington, D.C. or Bethesda, Maryland. And, and we technology has brought other people's influence close to us. Look at us. We're talking real time from, you know, across the pond. But um, it be, the fact that the most people do it, the fallacy of consensus is what's hijacked here. If most people do it, it must be right. So let's say that you're going to try to start farming for the first time. You're going to put up a farm and you want your own free range chickens. And you want your, to get your own lemon tree growing. You know, I don't know if that'll work where you are, but, uh, you know, you're going to look on YouTube and you're going to read books and you're going to see how is it done. Because what are you going to do with a melon seed? I don't know what I'm going to do with a melon seed, but I'm going to see what other people do with it. And in that, in that process, we become persuaded that because other people did it and it worked, it must be right. And that leads to this, this great classical story of the fact that, you know, why are rail cars on, in Western countries exactly the distance apart that they are, the wheels, the, the axles, the, the wheels, the, the rails themselves are a certain distance apart? 
and people think, well, that's you know, that was the age of technology. They were, you know, must be optimized some way. In reality, what it was is that the original rails, uh, when they first put vehicles on rails, they were they they used axles that were around and were available, and those were from wagons, and they they weren't steam locomotives with with metal bodies. They were wooden, right? And these axles were that length, uh, that width, because the wagons had to fit in the ruts that other wagons left. And if you didn't conform, then you're not going to be able to get through that muddy patch. You're not going to be able to traverse the countryside. Well, that goes all the way back to the Roman Empire. The, the, our, our rail cars are the same width as the, 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 the Roman chariot for the same reason. That's how persistent this is. Mm. And um, we make presumptions of authority where they don't exist. And it, what, where the psychopaths in our society do is they figure out how to hijack those. They figure out how to, and, and we call it marketing, we call it making your website look right, we call it right, but the psychopaths will put something a higher value, they'll put a place a higher value on what they're offering uh, that is actually valuable because hey, they have an opportunity and who wouldn't want to advance yourself? But you're exactly right that, that when, when we have a limited resource situation, which we certainly do on this planet, it's not unlimited in space, it's not unlimited in fresh air and water, um, then, then the, 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 the currency that you brought up, the billions of dollars, what are they going to do with all of it? Well, we know what Bill Gates wants to do with it. He wants to block out the sun and save the world, right? He wants to actually create artificial breast milk. Yeah, there's so many things that he wants to do with his money for the betterment of human, in his view of what's betterment. And I wonder if this guy just feels so guilty all the time that he feels that he has to be the hero. He has to be the guy, you know? But if, if, if we can learn what's valuable from a constant improvement perspective instead of the way that it is. Okay, so there are conservatives out there that say, well, I'm not sure about that, right? Conservative, we're going to keep things the way that they are. Progressive liberal, we're going to change. But constant improvement philosophy tells us that we're going to constantly evaluate and give feedback, meaningful feedback, objective feedback to the processes that we establish a society on we can do some good in terms of knowing that we're not optimal simply because we've done this for 18,000 years this way it doesn't mean that it's the optimal way for humans to do it right there can be a better ways to do it um and so i think the fallacy of consensus combined with fear brings about this you know sociological conformism in a great number of people and of course gaslighting is fair game now in terms of public health policy, you know, do you? I don't know if you know this or not, but in the United States, they actually passed a law a couple of years ago, um, allowing, or it was a signing statement. I'm not sure, making it legal for the government to lie to the public. Right. So it's not a problem. There's no crime committed if there's propaganda used on the on the public. But they had to codify it. And so, well, what does a person trying to make their way in the world do? Um, I would think that we would insist on more people bringing reality into policy. That's what we need. And that means people need to get involved into politics who would never, ever, ever want to be a politician. That's what I think that we need. I think we need actual um, people showing up at meetings, telling the public health board, the local health board, the county health board, the reality and, and, and telling your governor what you want and and how yeah, you know I, 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 what you want i think you're right yeah i think you're right and 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 that kind of getting getting to know what what we want and getting to know what's right i mean probably one of my favorite american writers would be thoreau you know i mean i don't know if thoreau was a republican or not he, he, perhaps he was you know i mean he, in civil disobedience you know is probably a, an essay and an article that, that really needs to be read again by a lot of American citizens, I think, you know. And Thoreau is not, was certainly not a, a violent man and not a proponent of violence, I think, in any sense at all. Um, 
but you know, I mean, his his classic kind of the quote, "Government is best," which which governs least. You know, I mean, that's kind of part. It kind of sums up the Republican notion um, in many respects of kind of you know withholding socialism and withholding kind of you know benefits from people and kind of withholding a net to kind of catch people so that they don't wind up kind of like San Francisco, the wealthiest city and probably the planet, and you've got the zombie apocalypse down on mission with people walking around, you know, vets and people with mental illness who are walking around in one of the wealthiest places on the planet, and you've this army of, of destitute people living in the street, and there's this kind of policy, you know, that you know, government is best, it governs least, so like, leave them alone, it's their own fault, it's their wasters, they're losers, they're bums, they're not taking advantage of the great opportunity our country has to offer and all of that, that, that crap, you know. But I, I think that misses Thoreau's point, it misses Thoreau's point hugely, you know, uh, and perhaps maybe if, if Thoreau's point was to be made maybe more concisely, maybe it should be said that government is best which needs to govern least. Now, I think when you put in the needs to govern the least, you're putting back on the people that they have to have a sense of self-governance. You know, yeah. we, we have to kind of, we have to have an independence, an ability to evaluate what we want the state to do for us and what the role the state is. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that we should have a zombie apocalypse with people around San Francisco and then techie guys sitting in coffee shops making, you know, millions of dollars looking out the window munching on an Abbott salad and talking to Siri and trying to find out if their Tesla shares have gone up and then some guy is walking past who's maybe a Vietnam vet or maybe he's mentally ill or maybe was raped and abused as a kid and he's homeless and the techie guy is looking out at him thinking, oh, that's a, that's a waste or that's another bum who's not taking advantage of our, our, our great opportunities. So I, I'm not kind of trying to reinforce that Republican notion that government is best, which governs least. It's the Thoreauian idea, I think, that of this independence, you know, I mean, Thoreau, when he went out to Walden Pond and he did his little social experiment in the woods, and you know, there's a be some beautiful lines in Walden Pond where Thoreau talks about, you know, listening to a blackbird singing in a, th in a tree, and he compares that to maybe the symphonies and the great records or CDs or whatever music that we might like to listen to, you know, sure. and, and he, he, he makes the point that when you're listening to that blackbird singing in the tree, you know, of course it sounds silly and, and, and maybe childish, but you're listening to a piece of music there that's the culmination of uh, millions of years of evolution that has a purpose in the ecosystem, a purpose in the environment, that, uh, that's connected into the cosmos in a deep kind of a spiritual and realistic and scientific and biological way. And you're hearing that song and it will, no one will ever hear that song again and it's unique for you and you can hear that and it costs absolutely nothing. You don't need to, to go or fly to Germany and listen to Mozart or Beethoven. You, you know, I, what Thoreau was saying, this evaluation of what's important to us as human beings, simple, basic, honest realities of mm. having sex, have a smoke. If you like to smoke, have a smoke. If you like a glass of whiskey, have a glass of whiskey. Everything in moderation. Enjoy the natural, evolutionary, instinctual pleasures that are inherent. Don't resent yourself for them. Do things in moderation. Enjoy your body. Enjoy your health. But we seem to have lost the plot. And I think that there's a, you know, and we're consumed by consumption and owning shit and everything else. And, you know, there's a big difference between, for example, like COVID in the U.S. and, and COVID in Ireland. You know, in, 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 in the U.S., you've got a lot of, of high levels of obesity, high levels of diabetes. So, you know, we over here in Ireland and in most of Europe where we don't have those problems to the extreme, and, you know, 90% of the COVID deaths are kind of, are over the age of 65. Well, you're going to get a skewed pattern in the U.S. because, as we said at the start, it's, it's, it's comorbidity and age. Right. So when you get a lot, of, a lot of comorbidity in the population, you're going to get a skewed view. But, you know, we need to be asking, why does America have so much obesity and so much marginalization and so much dependence on sugar and so much, God, so much fucking unhappiness. This is the thing I can't understand, and this is the thing I can't understand about my fellow man, my race, and sometimes I can't understand it about myself, is that why do we choose 
these complex scenarios to get involved in and, and in trying to kind of achieve and, and be something to other people and live a, an external life when the fundamental human instinct instinct as I said having sex enjoying your nice food having a conversation reading a book the basic stuff makes us all and keep becoming obese diabetics from becoming overweight, depressed, suicidal, homeless, all of these things, these basic kind of things that keep us happy. Because happiness, I think, is the antidote to so many medical conditions. It's the answer to stop, you know, subclinical symptoms from becoming clinical. It stops the, 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 the asthmatic. If he gets stressed, he has an asthma attack. The epileptic, if he gets stressed, he has a seizure. You know, sure. the, the cardiovascular disease, the, the biggest killer, you know, it's overweight, obesity, high cholesterol diet. So the fundamental thing behind illness, behind even the differing stats in COVID in the U.S. and here is not so much the diabetes, blah, blah, blah. It's the unhappiness of the human subject and our inability to think independently of the herd independently of our government this is what I think Thoreau was, Thoreau was talking about you know right. to think independently and enjoy the biological instinctual pleasures now I'm not saying that people should run around and kind of you know jerking off on the sidewalk and stuff and you know experiencing their pleasures in a crazy way but I'm saying a rational approach to what's important in life to the pleasures in life you know, that is an antidote to what's going on with COVID, to what's going on with vaccines, to what's going on with materialism and capitalism, to an evaluation of Trump on his kind of merits. If we kind of look at people, or Bill Gates, and we ask ourselves, well, are these guys really intelligent if they're kind of spending so much time trying to hoard all of these billions when we know it's kind of, you don't need them, you know? So yeah, there's, there's an, a, there's an individual a... ability to think about things and think about our own basic needs seems to be what's missing from the dialogue. Absolutely. And rugged American individualism, I'm so glad you got to spend some time and see some of that here, uh, is, it forms a core basis on both sides of the political spectrum. It's not the conservatives that are just rugged individualistic, but it's, there's a, how do we get there? So how, the, the, how do we get there is, you know, we have to end this influence of corporations. And I say that not just because it's easy to say, but it's, it's through, after much depth, in-depth analysis and thought, the corporation owes its allegiance to itself. It's an amoral, not an immoral entity. The bottom line will persist. If you follow the bottom line, you will persist. And corporations can exist theoretically into perpetuity, whereas individuals die, right? Corporations outlast individuals. And so this corporation, the for-profit corporatization of things like our food culture, mm. our agriculture, that, that, yep. that boils down to whether or not we have the Constitution as individuals to make choices on con at the level of consumption, or do we go for the convenience? Do we take our own personal responsibility f for ourselves in terms of where our food comes from, in terms of what we put on our plate in front of our children, what we feed our children? And the profit motive that exists in corporations, of course, causes them to do two important things. One is to increase the amount that they can put out at the cheapest cost to themselves, and that lessens the quality of what Absolutely. we're eating, drinking, right, consuming for entertainment, and so on. And and the second is um, um, to maximize well to, to maximize the profit, but but also to um, to persist over time. In other words, they have to make it from quarter to quarter. They're skipping the mentality of of, of quarterly reports, skipping from quarter to quarter. In medicine, mixing profit motive with medicine has, is an abject failure. It is not sustainable. Medicine in an economic growth model means, in, as it is in the United States, they literally have to increase profit every year. How do you do that with a finite population? You do it by increasing the number of people that get sick. How do you do that? You do that by turning a blind eye to things that make people get sick, right? And so it does. I agree with you 100% that it boils down to the individual. Therefore, people need to show up at 
um, their school board meetings and say, why are my children not being taught civics? The, every citizen in every country has a responsibility to participate in their own governance. It's a responsibility to themselves. It's a responsibility to the legacy of humanity. I was speaking with Bobby Kennedy Jr. on this show a couple of weeks ago, and I asked him, I said, what's the probability in a world that has nuclear reactors that we're going to have a nuclear reactor disaster? He said, 1.0, it's happened. I said, exactly right. And what's the probability on a planet that has BSL-4 laboratories, BSL-3 and 4 laboratories, that we're going to have an escaped pathogen that makes hundreds of millions of people sick? It's 1.0. It's going to happen. So to, to protect ourselves, I think we should build we should build infrastructure that's reserve infrastructure. It's obvious to say that in retrospect of what happened with COVID-19, but we knew it from Ebola as well over and over and over again. How many times were we short of PPEs in countries that had these outbreaks? So we're slow to learn. And we need to think like engineers. And other people said this as well, but I mean in terms of building a bridge. When you build a bridge, you build it 100 times more strong than anything that would ever go over it. You just do it. You, it's, it's, it, you compensate for your uncertainty and safety. So. We do need to build a reserve capacity for emergencies in the United States and around the world where where we can handle things like this without issues, no problem. But that does not necessarily mean it's the medical community that does that. And what I mean is, okay, how if we have to go ever have to go into lockdown for a prolonged period of time again, how do we do that where no one loses a job? How do we do that without shutting down small businesses? How do we do that without people having to empty their coffers? line up the questions and then the answers are self-evident it's it's going to boil down to each individual having accountability to themselves self-responsibility increasing how how i'm not as reliant on the government as or i'm not as reliant on and i have reserve capacity in my own home for things um it starts reforming education I've thought about this time and time again, uh, many issues when we come up with the crisis, we have to reform education, uh, at least in the United States, because we're really not teaching our children how to, how, and it's more than just problem solve, we're not teaching them how to anticipate, we're not teaching them how to imagine, we're not teaching them creativity, La you know, the lateral thinking um, is not there. In the United States, we teach to the test over and over and over again, year after year after year. And so how, what we don't do is we don't go to recent graduates from high school one, two, three, and four years later and say, would you mind participating in the survey and tell us how your public education went? How did it serve you? How did it deserve you? There's no quality control feedback whatsoever in terms of continuous improvement for education. It is what somebody up here thought would be the better policy. And then it trickles yeah. down and, and it's never going to work. Um, yeah, I, I actually think you, you, the U.S. education system, you know, I think the, the U.S. education system is one of its strengths, you know, and I think it's a, you know, it's, it's, it is one of America's strengths because, as I said, I mean, I went there, I went to California now, albeit it was back in the, back in the late 80s, you know, and there was a lot more investment in education back then because I've since been back to California um, on many, on, on a, quite a few occasions. And I've seen no investment, no palpable sense of any real investment. Like if you take California, which I'd be most familiar with, but you know, I mean, when you look at kind of infrastructure in terms of roads, the roads are full of potholes. There's no new train lines. There's no new motorways. There's no new. There's no new places to park. There's no. We all thought of, we were going to have no flying social. cars by now. We were going to have flying cars. Oh by yeah, now. yeah, yeah. Know. Well, look. You can have your flying cars, but you know, it, uh, unless you got somewhere to land them and somewhere to park them, you know. But but there's very very little, at least from what I've seen, very very little social investment in keeping not America great again, but keeping the American education system great again. Because I think you're absolutely right. I mean, if I didn't the United States and I didn't get my start in education in the United States, I mean, I'd probably still maybe I'd be just as happy, but I'd probably still be working on a building site. I certainly wouldn't have read. You know, literature, and I wouldn't have been exposed to, to, to Joyce and Beckett and Nietzsche and, and philosophy. I, you know, the most beautiful books that I've read in my life have absolutely nothing to do with medicine, and I never got them in college. But I got a, a joy of 
learning and a joy of knowledge and I got a sense of achievement because the beauty about the American education system and I don't think you know Americans really appreciate this and I think Americans should never lose sight of this the beauty of the American education system is this notion of the individual I mean when I would take classes in the US and my daughter was was, was taking classes in San Francisco there for, for a year her last year of high school uh, over here she did a, 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 an Erasmus um, in the US but you know I, I remember I rang my daughter up once she was studying in 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 in, in, in San Francisco in in a high school and and how are you getting on you know uh, how are you getting on with all the, the the weird kids you know I said to her you know and she said to me something I've never forgotten she said dad you know there there's no weird kids in the class over here because everybody's weird mm -hmm. you know and you know what she was essentially saying, she was bringing back my own love for the American education system and that you can be, you can go to college and you can pick a class in underwater basket weaving or pick a class in, in marine biology or astronomy. You know, you can go to a junior college if you don't do well in high school and you can kind of pick classes in what you're interested in. And the opportunity for a cultivation of knowledge, it's probably nowhere more open to its population than, than arguably than, than in the U.S. So I'm a big, big fan of the U.S. education system and you're right, it has to be invested in and it has to be preserved. But, but here's the question, you know, if you're going to educate people in the U.S. and you're going to provide people with an education within the context of a system that has various values for success and various definitions for success, then you know, in the U.S. itself, you know, there's a wonderful documentary that goes into this point by a philosopher, a British philosopher called Elaine de Botton, and it's on YouTube, and it's called Status Anxiety. But what de Botton is talking about is, is that he makes this observation in, in the U.S. that nobody in the U.S., or very few people in the U.S. seem to be happy, kind of working as a waitress or working as, there's a kind of a status thing where mm -hmm. if you're working as a waitress you're a failure if you're kind of working in a in a in a in a, in a restaurant you're a failure if you're working as a mechanic well you know you didn't really get ownership of the american dream and you didn't you kind of failed you flunked now this notion of success and failure in the us i firmly believe that that's the most destructive evil part of american life because, you know, working in a cafe and, you know, living on tips and, you know, hopefully, you know, if, if, if you can survive and you can manage and you can access some of the simple pleasures in life, you know, there's no, there's no failure in that. There's no well, failure so in a PhD and not being an MD. But the society has this sort of a built-in notion, like Trump, for example, yeah. he's the archetype of success. But that's all complete bullshit. And that's where the American dream falls down because it gives people opportunity but then tells them, well, if you don't become an astronaut or become a successful lawyer or if you don't, then you're somehow less than the guy who did. And that's where the American dream, I think, really eats itself and destroys itself because success, and I'm sure you would agree, is not about how much you've got in your bank account. It's about how much you have in your soul, in your heart, in your mind, in music, it's all those kind of cliche yeah. things we talk about, but they're yeah. very, very true. You know, it's about music and food and enjoying things. But that notion, that hierarchical notion that you've got in the US where, you know, the president has to be a billionaire and he's got to be able to have billions of dollars in order to finance his account. This, this joy of the ordinary person, this celebration of being an ordinary person, of being a carpenter, being working with your hands, digging the little patch in the back of your garden. I mean, you know, why is it the people in the, in the U.S. with diabetes and shit, why isn't there a kind, and, and over here too, why don't we have a national program that gets people out into their backyard turn over the soil, stick a few spuds in there, watch them come up, appreciate the whole, I mean, we've got all these publications and research, we have a whole institution called science, you know, but all behind that is the spud coming up through the ground, you know, photosynthesis, the sunlight hitting it. So yeah. we've got all this data all about the science, but why don't we have a love for it? Why don't we calm down, slow the fuck down, chill the fuck out about trying to be something and trying to become, you know, better than our neighbors and everything. Very well and said. actually yeah. enjoy the simple, simple pleasures. I think that's where American education fails. It's not so much the, the, the education, it's the context of success that that education is conducted in 
that causes the, the, the failures, you know? I think that's exactly right. So a few years ago, I would say the same thing about the United States education system, but uh, it's fallen down in a couple of important ways. I've been for a long time calling for uh, teaching of civic responsibility, and nobody seems to want to teach civics to our students. They don't understand how government works. They really don't. They don't understand their role. Most importantly, they don't understand their role. They, you, it's assumed that you're going to learn it through your history books, and you learn the Constitution a little bit. You're going to learn the founding fathers a little bit, you know, but it's not ever taught as a formal discipline. Okay, this is how you approach problem solving in politics. And so what do we have? We have neophytes, newbies that come out that they try to be politically active. It gets frustrating very, very quickly because they don't know how to hold a dialogue. They don't know the rules of the road, so to speak. They don't know that you can interrupt any public meeting in the United States of America by simply saying, I have a point of order, a clarification question. And when I did that at the Allegheny County Board of Health, they threatened to arrest me. Granted, it was the second time I did it, but it had been separated by a year. They knew who I was. I asked a point of order question. They're supposed to have a discussion before a vote. And I called them out on the rules. I knew the rules better than they did. But, you know, there's this fancy free be whoever you want to be in a way i'm going to counter it with uh, a challenge that doesn't that kind of lower lower the bar not intentionally but it kind of lowers the bar on uniqueness if everybody is unique then how does anyone distinguish themselves which is i'm fine with that i'm fine with it personally but what's the context what does anything have any meaning in that context and it's kind of like post postmodernism, where okay everything is exactly equal because we say it is and by definition it should be that way because we imbue value on things artificially, these artificial constructs that are man-made. Uh, and, and, and where I would see that education would need to improve in the United States dramatically uh, is the second area, in addition to teaching civics, is the teaching of science. Over the past five years, we've taken this nosedive in teaching science where instead of hypothetical deductivism and stating a hypothesis and, and testing the hypothesis and re replication and all the, all the standard, you know, useful ways of conducting science. The, the students now are taught to look at the majority of the evidence. And if, if you can line up the majority of the evidence, and it's, in, it's definitely instead of, it's not in addition to, the majority of the evidence is the preferred way then we're back to the school of positivism where we're lining up confirming instances of things that we believe and that's very dangerous to an open society because we can point to confirming instances of the homeless on the streets of San Francisco and we can say anything we want about them based on the evidence that we decide is evidence. We decide to collect certain amounts of evidence. We decide to ignore other kinds of evidence because, well, we're going to call that irrelevant or unreliable, but the best evidence, which is different than consilience. Consilience is taking a bunch of objectively collected pieces of evidence, and because you can't do the right kind of experiment, you can come to some assessment about what the most likely reality is. Um, but in this context, then, we're, I feel like in the United States, we're sit, it's, it's, it's 1930 Germany all over again right now. It, it is. And I said earlier that Trump should not be involved in discussions of public health in the man, to the extent to the degree that he's been intimately involved with. And I don't want anybody to think that it's just Trump that I think should, shouldn't be involved in that. I don't think any politician, any politician should inject politics into the discussion of public health. And I don't think public health issues and medical issues should be politicized. But because we have this beast on our back, it's not just a monkey. We have a huge beast of for-profit medicine on our back that is an ever incessantly hungry for more and more and more. It will be sustained. It will be fed. I don't see an end game for that. And what I, I hate to say it, but I do see a totalitarian mindset coming here in the United States with many, many more influences from the medical community than is should be welcome in any healthy society to persist their particular infrastructure. So reform education, back off of the for-profit mentality, Get fire the accountants in medicine and start again. We absolutely have to fire the accountants. We do not answer to the bottom line 
in, a, in any way that's profitable because when we do that every time we do that we homogenize medical care you get the, the you get care by protocol you put everybody in new york city hospitals with COVID 19 on a ventilator at the same settings regardless of their age whether they're obese and it's high pressure and so you blow out their right and you don't learn by the way you never learn you don't have immediate feedback from the last patients that you and, and there's no built-in automated system that says hey something's wrong here it's kind of just the top-down culture and we do this because it's protocol and medicine by protocol kills people all the time the medical um, errors are the third leading cause of death in the united states we absolutely need to reform all of this big medicine i would love to see a lot more private practice it's like we need a massive walk away movement where we have private practices that are exploding across the united states accepting new patients and just let those old hospitals you know uh, there's a guy named ravi a uh, dr ravi uh in um ohio he has this great set saying that humongous you know lar large children's hospitals are not a sign of wellness they're a sign of sickness if we need such large hospitals humongous corporate hospitals for children it's not a sign of, of wellness it's a sign of sickness in a population so the, to to reconfigure all of that we'll, we'll take some people joining from within allopathy and who like yourself said enough is enough i'm not going to put up with these protocols anymore there's something wrong and so again, you know, I have to congratulate you on being ethical to stand up and say, I'm not going to participate in this process. I was, I walked away from a $300 an hour gig with the National Vaccine Injury Compensation Program because I couldn't put up with the corruption anymore. Uh, I, they, they bribed me to change my testimony and I wouldn't do it. I, I, I'd rather have no money from them and perpetuate that, that process in some way by being the dope that shows up just to have my testimony turfed uh, by lesser evidence uh by people who are in control but I, I couldn't do it so i, I stopped doing it's very, that very difficult. It's, it's, it's very very difficult you know i mean i've been practicing medicine for, for, for 20 years that and you know i i'm at the point now where I'm kind of I'm, I'm i'm almost kind of hitting burnout now i think and i'm not burnt out from my patients i enjoy my patients i love it when occasionally and i use that word with, with caution because it is only on occasion that, that I meet a real person who comes in and sits on the other side of the desk. You know, the vast majority, it's like you said earlier, you know, the, and, and you're absolutely true. You know, the, the, the state and, 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 and the media and, and kind of the, the society that we live in is very much in the business of engineering disease and facilitating disease. And the vast majority of, of doctors out there, you know, that, that that's what we're paid to do. And, and as I said earlier on, some of us are probably paid too much to do it. But, you know, I mean, if you think about, like, basic, like, human conditions, as we talked about earlier, we mentioned diabetes. You know, type 2 diabetes, you know, it's curable and it's treatable in the vast majority of cases. Now, I use the two words, curable and treatable, together. But I made a mistake when I did that because there's a big difference between cure and treat. But, you know, medicine, modern medicine in the U.S. and in the Western world is all about treating. You know, I don't have a dialogue. Very rarely do I have a dialogue with my patients where I'm trying to, to cure their type 2 diabetes or their hypertension or their obesity. You know, doctors nowadays are paid very well to have very brief conversations with patients and write them, you know, prescriptions from Big Pharma. That's what we're paid to do. But, you know, it, in 20 years of practice, it struck me over and over again that whilst I'm writing the script for pretensive or for the antibiotic that the patient has demanded, even though it's a viral illness, or I'm writing the script for the, the, the metformin or the insulin, you know, it, I feel a deep sense of sadness inside because I think to myself, there's another victim, a victim of me, the physician, a victim of society, and sadly a victim of themselves, you know, because, you know, the, the, as I said earlier on, the underlying pathology behind the vast majority of illness that I encounter every day and that I'm treating with Big Pharma to the benefit of Big Pharma, the vast underlying pathology is actually a private or deep or unconscious or even conscious unhappiness or dis-ease with their place in the world 
you know, mm. and medicine, unfortunately, in the context of a 10, 15 minute consultation, it, it's a rare thing that we have the opportunity to ask somebody, you know, and say, well, you know, are you happy or unhappy? You know, that question, that question should be tacked over the door of every doctor's surgery around the world. Think about this before you go inside because the doctor's going to ask you, are you happy or unhappy? Or do you even know the difference between the two? Do you have a definition for what happiness is? Like this basic philosophical premise that the human being has in terms of their own engagement with their body, their engagement with external reality, there's deep, deep, deep philosophy in there. There's deep, deep thinking in there. But yeah. unfortunately, as you said, it's all about now, it's about the corporation. It's about the industry of medicine. I mean, as I said, you know, in terms of the, the writing of prescriptions and the writing of, of, of drugs, the vast majority of elderly people, I would presume, probably in the U.S., certainly here in Ireland, they're, they're, the vast majority of them are victims of polypharmacy. I mean, you go into grandma's house and you open up the medicine chest in grandma's house, I'm sure it's the same in the U.S. as the same as here. You open up the, the, the doors of the medicine cabinet and I guarantee you, you're not going to be hit by a toothbrush. You're going to be hit by or a pair of false teeth. You're going to be hit by a selection of pillboxes that have all got a load of shit in them that grandma probably doesn't need. You know, so Absolutely. at the end of the day, it's it's gone so far. It, the whole system has evolved so far outside of the realm of kind of healthy diet, basic food. You know, we doctors have become so corrupted and we've become so immune to our own corruption. We've be become totally oblivious to our own role that we've actually exchanged those two words that I used at the start of this kind of diatribe, those yeah. two words, cure and treat. Doctors are not in the business of curing anymore. We're only in the business of treating. And hey, when we engage in this process of treating, we do exactly what you said at the outset of this dialogue. We facilitate the next drug. We facilitate the need for drug. We facilitate the pathology. And even deeper than that, we say to the patient, we say, yes, you are actually sick with an alien thing called hypertension or diabetes and we refuse you and I can engage in this dialogue patient and doctor where we refuse to accept that there's actually deep fundamental unhappiness there's problems here there's dissatisfactions there's there's relationships that we refuse to go there and we're just going to stay on the level of the nice expensive pill you know it's reductionist and very Cartesian problems. right it's very Cartesian that, that the patient has uh, something uh, wrong with their pinky so they have pinkyitis uh, right, they got Absolutely. pinky itis, and I'm a doctor because I put itis on the end of a body part. And by the way, Absolutely. by the way, you know, we tried to make it uh, unethical or tried to make it um, uh, impossible for corporations to incentivize certain prescriptions in the United States, and it's illegal for but it's individual gone. That's physicians. That, but it's that's okay. That's but it's a, but it's okay for corporations to incentivize practices. That's where the loophole is. So the accountants see the money coming in, and the accountants sanction doctors who act outside of protocol. That's a beast. That's what I mean by a beast. I have a lot of compassion. I'm not throwing medical doctors under the bridge, I'm, I'm, I'm under the bus. I absolutely understand the pressure that they're under, and we need to get we need to break the cycle of abusive funding of of medicine. And you know, Blue Cross Blue Shield here in the United States, the insurance scams and the and the and the um, the fraud, the insurance fraud that takes place of individual doctors cashing in, the, the doctor in, in Michigan that was treating people for cancer that didn't have cancer so he could sell more, you know, chemotherapy. Wow. Yeah, but what, what were those that's... people even doing going to that, that, that doctor, you know? Yeah. I mean, you, you were talking earlier about, about, you know, education and about improving kind of the type of education. You know, I, I don't know if, I, if, if, if I'm entirely convinced that, you know, if we give doctors more kind of clear facts and more evidence, you know, and if we kind of make science a little bit more kind of, you know, truthful and honest and we kind of cut out the crap and the lies and kind of present people with real facts, I'm not entirely certain that that's really going to make 
I mean, it will make a difference, certainly a significant difference, but to my mind, I, I, I don't think it goes far enough, you know. I, I think we have to go even kind of further than that, you know. And, and you know, like, I remember when I was living in, in, in New Zealand, one of the things that struck me about the, the very beautiful things about New Zealand is, is New Zealand's got an indigenous population of Maoris, you know. And, mm -hmm. and the, 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 the New Zealanders, they had a kind of a war. Or the Brits, when they went over to New Zealand and kind of took it over, they had a war with the Maori, the native population that was a fight, a bit like the cowboys and Indians kind of story of the U.S. Um, yeah. So that the natives were fighting against the colonizers. But something very different happened in New Zealand as to what happened in the U.S. In that the, the natives, they put up a pretty good fight. Now, I'm not saying the Native Americans didn't put up a good fight, wounded knee and, and all of the rest, but they sure bloody hell gave it the best. But the, the point that I'm making is that the New Zealanders made a treaty with the natives called the Treaty of Waitangi. And the Treaty of Waitangi was very, very interesting in New Zealand because it gave the natives control of a certain percentage of the parliament and it gave the, 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 the Brits, they gave the, the, New Ze the, the Maoris, they gave them control of swathes of land which they thought at the time were kind of useless. They, they gave the mountains down in the south and kind of what they thought were deserts up in the north. Now, the Treaty of Waitangi has stayed in place kind of throughout the history, and the New Zealanders celebrate that treaty, and they're very good. But the thing that's happened, living in New Zealand for five years, you see the influence of the native. You see the ideology, like for example, you know, 80%, 70%, 60, 70% of New Zealand's energy is made from renewable resources. Now, that's not because the Brits who went over there are particularly <laughs> more ecologically intelligent than the Brits who stayed in the UK. That's yeah. simply because the mountains that where the, the Brits might want to dam or build a nuclear power, power factory, well, the natives, they believe, the, the Maori people, they have beliefs that the mountain contains the spirit of their ancestors. They have an animistic um, view of nature. So um, natural resources, where all of these kind of natural resources are now, large swathes of them belong to the Maoris. So th th there's an ideology there that balances out capitalism, that balances out, that it insists upon social benefits for minorities because the minority is kind of has got a significant representation representation in the government. I always wonder to myself if the Native Americans, if Grant or, or Ulysses Grant had to turn around and say, "Well, right, look, we've got to kind of make peace with the Indians, and instead of trying to wipe them out, we're going to give them, you know, thirty percent or forty percent of seats in the House of Representatives." I always kind of wonder to myself how different would America be well, if it had beautiful. that voice of the native that voice if it what you're that, talking about what you're talking about is gen more generally known as the wisdom of the minority right yeah and 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 this is why politics fails modern politics fails in in, in the united states at least over polarization of um left versus right because the left is not really a minority. The right is not really a minority. It's a minority viewpoint because they don't hold the number of seats in the House, but it's not really a minority in the United States. It's not even an entity. It's an artificial platform that's redesigned every eight, four to eight years. It's a construct, and people swear and live and die by the fact that I'm a lifelong liberal or conservative, you know, uh, uh, Democrat or a Republican. And, and this polarization is another construct it's a it's a me mechanism it's what the un, under the matrix they would call the movie the matrix another layer of control it, it, in the united states it's very clear that this artificial way of doing politics of a two-party system has emerged in, in in now with with so many influences on the the democrats they have a now they have a taste for corporate money where corporatism has come in to the point where I now just plain out call it fascism. There's way too much fascism in the United States, too much for-profit interest, overt profit interest, overt discussion of um, uh, when debating laws and policies, whether or not they have figured out who, you know, how and how um, the most money is going to be made on the floor of the debate. Um, and, and, and it's... it's um, the, 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 the turnaround then for me 
is is to compare three different versions of the political spectrum in which the left and the right are are small differences with the more classical you know communism on one side and outright democracy populist democracy on the other and along that spectrum anywhere you are in that bigger spectrum is more important than left or right because the left or right will the democrats and republicans would exist if communism took over the united states democrats and republicans would exist if socialism took place if we came uh, if we became mob rule um complete democracy democrats and republicans would still exist and so that's not the big division the big division is on this individualism versus I need the state to do things for me. That's it falls into left versus right here, but it's really much more about state-owned fascism versus corporate-owned fascism. You know who's controlling who? Right? Absolutely, two two kinds. I mean, that's that's the problem. I think that's a significant problem in all Western kind of countries. We're, we're perhaps not the Scandinavians. The Scandinavians are very interesting, a very different subject matter entirely about how they go about politics and how they how they do things. They're certainly, if there's an evolution happening in politics, it's probably happening in Scandinavia because they're doing some very very interesting things. But in terms of the kind of the left and the right divide, you know, it's it's almost now it's becoming almost impossible to distinguish between you know and and right in different kind of countries you know i mean perhaps the republicans the kind of underlying ideology of limitless growth and you know maybe a little bit of kind of welfare thrown in and a little bit of environmental concern but you know the underlying ideology whether you're republican or democrat is you know massive economic growth economic development and of course the dogs on the street know that that's what's actually melting the icebergs or affecting the environment that that's what's actually causing the kind of social discohesion and dissatisfaction is all of this kind of wealth game but that's the underlying principle of either democrat or republican so you're right it's kind of fascist a type of kind of democratic fascism on one side and democratic fascism on the other side but yeah. i think it goes back to to, to you know and this no education that, that as you kind of pointed to you know the, the the thing about the the left and the thing about the right is is they're both kind of schools of you know most of the people i'm sure in congress and the house of representatives over there are kind of educated people at for, with formal educations but I think what's lacking in, in U.S. politics is kind of the same thing that's lacking in a lot of Western politics. And that's, you know, a little bit of soul, you know. And, and th that's why I mentioned that, that, that example of the Maoris and that example of when, a, when you've got a left and a right and you've got it, that are becoming the same. Well, if you've got this kind of, you know, historical or cultural or, or you know, group or, or, or part of the nation spirit, like the Native Americans once were in the U.S., you know. But if, if America has lost its Native American population, if it's farmed them out and put them on reservations and given them alcohol or pox blankets or whatever it was to wipe them out, if they're pretty much gone off the picture, there's still a little bit of soul left in America to educate you know this fascist group and that soul i mean i love rap music i think rap music is absolutely i'm, I'm totally cardi b for example is a rap <laughs> singer i really like her but mm. when you listen to cardi b songs the thing i love about cardi b is this woman is sexually liberated now she does she talks about having an orgasm screwing a guy you know, she's sexually liberated in the sense that, you know, if she's going to have sex with a guy, the guy better be able to satisfy her. She's going to enjoy it. It's all about having fun. And there's an equality there. Now, people might think that Cardi B is kind of crass and gross and she's talking about she's going to get a diet, she's going to do this and suck a dick or this sort of thing, you know, and might all be very offended by all of that. But actually, if you listen to what's going on and kind of rap music, and the, and, and the, which is a big part of the soul of, Amer of, of black America, if you listen to in that, there's a real liberation for women. There's a real power there of standing up. That's kind of, that's an evolution of women power. Now, you go back and you look at kind of in music and you look at the Spice Girls, and it was all about kind of showing your tits and shaking your ass and wearing a mini skirt, and it was all about being sexy to a guy and appearing kind of gorgeous to him 
but and essentially being you know almost you know uh, 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 chauvinistic in a sense women were kind of being anti-feminist in, in this whole you know hype up of their sexuality because their sexuality is just appealing to the guys so it's on a on a different trajectory but you know there, there's a soul in America and it may not be the Native American population may be almost extinguished perhaps or maybe there's a little bit of life left in it but black America I, I, I'm kind of shocked and always remain will remain shocked for the re remainder of my days the black America isn't looked at by Republicans and Democrats as a source of soul Get some life into your political. Pro get some music back. Start singing. Get it up. Shake down. Listen to the kind of the. You know, Americans are are, are very white. America is a little bit kind of you know cautious, conservative kind of you know religious, and and that's all good. That's all good. But you go to a you go to a black church and you see them singing. You see them dancing. You see a bit of life, a bit of joy, a bit of happiness. I think that's what medicine needs a bit of soul. It's what politics needs, a bit of soul. And you know, a lot of people in the, U the U.S. is very, very, very much like Dorothy. You know, when she got to the Wizard of Oz and she kind of said, I, I want to get back to Kansas. I, I, I got to get back to Kansas. How am I going to get back to Kansas? The Wizard says, well, look, all you got to do is you got the shoes on there. You just got to click your heels together and everything is going to be fine. You're going to be back in Kansas. And of course, a lot of us are thinking, geez, what the hell did she have to go through all the yellow brick road and the witch and the poison and all that shit? All she had to do was click her heels together. I think America, education, science, much of the issues that you and I are talking about yes. are because of this fundamental lack of comfort, ease with ourselves, relaxation, chill out, calm down, sit down, Donald. Take a back seat, that relax, calm down. And in order to do that, we have to have a little bit of sexual liberation, dietary liberation. And I don't want an eating crap food, but liberating ourselves in terms of what is good food, what is good sex, what are the simple pleasures in life. Then people, if they're more happy and because they get a bit of soul in their life, they won't be coming in front of mugs like me, giving me a ball of money in order to, for me to give some of that ball of money to the drug companies. You know, we, we can kind of nip it in the bud. We're, American, in many respects, is a little bit like, as I said, like Dorothy. You've got, you've got the ingredients there. There's stuff there happening. But it's just not appreciated and it's not loved and embraced and understood and reveled in. You know, it's a bit like, just like the old people. I don't mean to wrap it on, but it's a little bit like the old people. What the hell are we doing living in a world where we're taking these beautiful old people and we're dumping them into nursing homes? And we're kind of going away and leaving them there. And then we're making up all these excuses like, oh, they, we can't care for them at home, you know. Why can't you care for, for grandma and grandpa at home? You know, why can't you kind of, you know, look at your finances, try and look after them, get some support in from the state, you know, and not, not doing it from a sense of obligation, but, you know, doing it from a sense of interest because all people are actually interesting. We've lost sight of this. You know, women want to die there. As soon as guys come into me all the time, say, Oh, I'm going bald or I'm going like it's some kind of a disease, you know, women all dye in their hair gray, like as a cat dye in their hair, you know, back to color because gray is some sort of a disease. As a population, we have this view, as a Western developed population, we have this view of age as being some sort of a pathology. But I mean, is it really, where's that view coming from, wanting to dye your hair a different color? Like what the hell's wrong with being gray? What, 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 what we refuse matter? to do is at least at least india overtly has right said if you are a woman who's unmarried over the age of 45 you are a lower social class because you're economic liability so it's right in their face they don't they don't mince words you you there's a class of there's a yeah. class of personhood for them at least they're overt about it we don't have the wherewithal the temerity of and and the ethics to say that we are mistreating our elderly with ageism in medicine. We're going to give this procedure to you if you're 20 year old, but we're not going to give the same procedure. And we're going to make up some yeah. excuse, like they might get pneumonia and die, right? They're going to make up some excuse. Um, uh, in, in reality, now that we have this kind of semi-socialized medicine that, uh, you know, uh, everyone's supposed to have um, health insurance, whether they want it or not, that's a forced consumption of a commodity, in my view. But um, we have 
no more excuses. And, you know, in New York State, Andrew, Governor Andrew Cuomo opened up all the nursing homes and said, you will take in new patients, whether you want to or not. You will take in new clients, whether you want to or not. Yeah. And, and the yeah. nursing homes were like, don't bring them here. We have coronavirus. And these people are going to get coronavirus. They're going to die. So on the other end of the issue, we've had thousands of people die because they went into nursing homes and they never should have gone there. Um, I love what you're talking about, this, this what I call the wisdom of minority. Um, I think that the, 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 the very first reaction in this Black Lives Matters thing is, is this, is this another opportunity that happens every four or eight years where all of a sudden the Democrats discover the, the, the Black Caucus again? And I don't speak um, for anybody but myself. I don't speak for the Black Caucus. I don't speak for any African Americans. But is this another of the patronizing relationships that have persisted with this, you know, creative, colorful population, uh, you know, vibrant culture that we have here in the United States, whereby our politicians all of a sudden become aware again? Oh yes, we have to address the Black Caucus. And unfortunately, in my analysis, I think that most of what's pushing the Black Lives Matters into the fore during a pandemic where you're going to have protests is this, I, you know, kind of like game of chicken, political chicken with Donald Trump and the other side to say, okay, we dare you to try to stop a, a protest. We dare you to shut it down in the name of the pandemic because that's going to secure the votes for our side. Um, it doesn't mean that there's not racism in America. Of course there is. It doesn't mean that people shouldn't be able to protest. Of course they should. But it does mean that the, the reason why our media will cover it the way that they do, the media is allowed by their corporate masters to cover it the way that they do, is because they think that it's going to forward a particular agenda. And you have to be able to see through yeah. all of that. How can, a, how can a typical American person who's simply dealing with the issue on the very first surfaced issue, the very first surface yeah. of the issue, they never get to the, to, 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 to the, to, to the next layer of control. How, how do we emerge as a new civilization or this so-called new normal when the pe we're not the rule makers the people are not the rule makers here we don't have the power to make these new rules and and, and that's why I, I do think that we need we, we we need public health policies to be apolitical we need medicine to be a a not for profit and we need we need massive reform in politics so you know there's a, a, a an old saying that the reason why we have such shitty presidents all the time is because the only people that would ever, you know, be worthy of the office would never go through the process of compromising themselves to get it, right? Yeah. And, and, and so... Um, we, can, well, we can make the policies for ourselves, you know, I mean, we can, we do have a sense of, of autonomy. Like, I mean, I, I, I was very fond of, 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 of Obama, and I really liked Obama, um, and I, I like him more, you know, I mean, I'm not saying he was perfect. He, of course he wasn't, you know, no man is, but you know, he had a beautiful, he had a beautiful spirit about him. He had a beautiful kind of humanitarianism about him. He had a kindness, you know, about him and a warmth about him and a kind yeah. of roll up your sleeves and, and hug people. Now maybe half of it was all bullshit and for show, I don't know, you know, but you know, one of the criticisms I'd make of, of, of Obama, you know, uh, you know, or, or, and I'm very fond of Michelle, I think she's a beautiful, absolutely beautiful and super intelligent woman, you know, but you know, I look at other other Af African American women who embrace, for example, the the, the natural flow of of, of of African American hairstyles or that sort of thing, and and I'm very very cautious when about when when we try to kind of you know turn ourselves into an image that's kind of more publicly presentable, you know. So this idea of of whether government has autonomy over us. If if we're not exercising autonomy over the self, like if we take it, if, if we consider the very notion of what's beautiful and what's artistic and what's kind of pleasing to the human subject, you know, throughout time that constantly changes. You know, there was a time when being fat was beautiful, and there was a time when big boobs were in and small boobs are in, and being skinny. Mm -hmm. You know, so this notion of what's beautiful is constantly kind of changing in it's a in society. Right. Something. Sure. It's, 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 it's a construct, you know, but essentially when we try to make a carve ourselves into a public notion of beauty, like 
this notion of ageism in the nursing homes and you know the abuse of people in the nursing homes that happened there's no two ways about it it happened here and it probably happened worse in the US because you guys got COVID long after so you should have even known way before anybody what was coming and you guys are certainly compared to a small country like Ireland you've got the wealth and the resource to really nail that shit down and make sure that it wasn't going to hurt the elderly because you had a lot of resource to do but it wasn't done but, but the point that I'm making is if we accept that abuse in the nursing homes happened in lots of different different places. Yes, we can blame the government, and the government should take blame for that because essentially they behave very, very stupidly in trying to pander to yummy mummies and to people who the virus wasn't going to affect, and we all knew that. But let's if we put that aside and we ask ourselves about ageism in general, and we say, well, you know, what's a woman trying to do when she injects a bit of Botox into her face? I mean, it's harmless. She's allowed to do it if she wants to have bigger lips and everything. But, you know, if a woman can't be happy with the natural biological process of aging, and I don't mean happy in the sense that she should settle for this horrible thing, but if we can't embrace the things that happen to our bodies, the natural things that we can't change, you can inject all the Botox you like, but you're not going to take years off your life. So we can't change. So we're engaged in this stupid, really stupid process of trying to avoid the signs of age ourselves. And we kind of all do it, you know, huge swathes. I mean, there's billion, billion dollar industries, you know, all on the basis of ageism, of trying for us to present ourselves. And that's what I mean about kind of my minor criticism about, you know, black America, about maybe Michelle, and, and as I said, no personal criticism to her. I think she's an absolutely wonderful woman. But, you know, I have more, increasingly more respect for people who can look at themselves, for a woman who can look at herself and say, you know what, here's my gray hair, I love it. Now, when you think about beauty in terms of personality, the person that you want to be around, the sexy woman, is not the woman who's got the big boobs or whatever, but the, the woman that you, maybe you want to jump into bed with her and you want to have sex and, and she's sexually arousing, perhaps. But a woman that you want to marry, in my opinion, or someone you want to spend the rest of your life with, is someone who's got that magic of self-confidence, someone who's got that magic of a belief in themselves, who isn't mm -hmm. running around trying to be something to please everybody else, but someone where it comes from deep inside, they're chilled out, they're relaxed, they can enjoy their own body, be proud of themselves. Now, and I'm not saying, I, I think Michelle Obama was all of those things, and perhaps all of those things and more, but the point that I'm making essentially is, is that this ageism that we're pointing to at politicians and everything, yeah, these guys need to bloody stand and be accounted for the absolute mess and the horrific, what you could easily refer to as manslaughter that went on in the nursing homes. There's no question about that. But on a fundamental level, why are old people in nursing homes, why are our kids, for example, not going into nursing homes and having a buddy program? Like, yeah. is it so gross to be, you know, looking after grandpa and having to wipe his ass or whatever? You know, when you do those things and when you care for an elderly person, you're actually doing something very profound, very beautiful. I mean, there used to be a whole science called scatology where doctors, you know, spent, you know, years and years studying shit, you know, even bacteria, <laughs> feces, plants, life, th there's beauty in everything, but something, something very sinister is refining our notion of what it is that's beautiful and what is the beautiful life and what is the beautiful self, and I sure. think that's, it's the absence of, of a personal philosophy, and as you said, there's problems with education, but I think the principal problem with education absence of philosophy there and we need to be thinking and having there needs to be a rebirth we need to have a Greek type revolution in the world where we're talking about Schopenhauer and Nietzsche and we're talking about philosophy and ideas because when we engage with this dialogue about what they did wrong in the nursing homes and what the Democrats do and what the Republicans do we're locked into the same old same old shit we're doing the same crap that they're actually doing to us we're kind of legitimizing their shit by having that sort of a crappy dialogue about Black Lives Matter and all of this kind of shit. You know, what's missing, really, I think, is, is philosophy and having philosophical dialogue and philosophical talk with ourselves and with philosophy itself.
I, th I think you're right. The, the, the world is so small now. We have Asian philosophers, of course, and we have African philosophers. There's even Native American writings that are that are of high value, that that should be contemplated. It's 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 the, the difference between philosophy and religion is that is attribution, right? And so we don't have to teach all religions. Right. The thing about not teaching religion in school and keeping church and, and, and school separate, uh, you know, and church and state separate in the United States is, OK, fine, we'll have religion in school. But which one? Where do we how do we choose which one? And the, this, yeah. the same thing for, with philosophy. The, there's so much horizontal breadth of the human experience of cognition and ways of thinking and ways of experiencing that if we were to teach philosophy at this point in time it would be completely unacceptable politically to try to teach western philosophy i think that that's that 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 that's done we've lost that there's deconstruction of anything european in the united states simply because it's european in in this swing back there's this blowback going on politically and and for anyone to stand up and to speak about that doesn't mean that they're racist and it doesn't mean that they're say pro-white uh well, europeans happen to mostly be white at the time that we're talking about um but to, to bring soul into our society is not to it also kind of puts us in the driver's seat if you will from okay we need to bring soul into our society we need to give minorities a voice um the principle of self-determination and pulling yourself up from your bootstraps. I know most of the conservative friends that I have who are who stand aghast at, you know, the the, uh, the 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 deaths that have occurred at the hands of the police. At the same time, they stand aghast at the dramatic um, reaction to that in terms of protests and fires and riots and things. They would love to celebrate someone who pulled themselves up by their bootstraps. And we tried mm -hmm. socialism. We tried socialism in many ways with the, you know, the New Deal is a bit socialistic. We tried it, I, and I loved, you know, Clinton's back to work program, you know, welfare to work program. I thought that was okay. Yes, you're going to have some welfare, and you, but you're going to also be applying for jobs. This human instinct to try to do things the easiest way, the, with the least. Oh, well, how did you get yours done? Oh, I got mine done because I go to this person because they'll check the box. People game the system. People from all walks of life and all races game the system to their own personal convenience and need. And therefore, they're betraying their own personal responsibility, their own personal bootstrapping to stand on their own two yeah. feet. And it's, I, I don't stand in a, any other position than gratitude for, for the fact that I work in a not-for-profit and I'm completely dependent on the public for their donations. You know, I don't build things with my hands and sell them. I didn't, didn't have to work out my marketing scheme and I don't have to do this and I don't have to do that. But I am doing science in a manner that should reduce human pain and suffering. And I think I, you know, the, the, the mantle that I wear, the identity that I put on, and that's what's what's wrong with what we're doing is we, we become our positions. We, we, we assume that we yes. are, right? And we marry our that's identity right. and our ego to our positions. And if we could stop doing that, we could teach people that you're going to have a career, yes, but you're probably going to have seven different jobs. And to yeah. redefine career as the succession of positions, your whole career, yeah. your resume is going to be varied. Um, then, then, then we can teach people that, listen, trade school is really a good thing for you. It's not just the yeah. default, like plan B. It's not a second Absolutely. rate it's a great yeah. thing because yeah. you can get over the same time period of time that that your co people in your cohort coming out of school goes off and, and gets all this student debt maybe they go to graduate school or medical school for god's sake and then they become so overwhelmed with debt by that time you've got your house half paid off right yeah. you've, you've had a job now for six or seven years and you're seven eight years and you've got a family and You've got you're you're building your retirement and the, the keys the keys yeah. to the castle if you will in terms of happiness i think is that people want to feel that they have a predictable future the the the, yeah, the, the fear of the unknown you're, you're and, totally and, right. yep. and 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 so the to, to tell them your future is unpredictable 
And therefore, I'm predicting with high reliability that your future is unpredictable. That's just the way that it is. Expect change. Change is the only constant. That's the kind of depth of uh, approach that, 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 that will, will, will help people know to not be disappointed when their job no longer exists and that kind of thing. Yeah, well, I, so. and I think the, the point you made there about us becoming our identity, you know, I think that's a crucial, a crucial point. We can yeah, we, we confuse our positions, our, our our career positions, and our yes. titles with our with ourselves we, as an exactly. as an individual. Yeah, for sure. One of the things I often say, I often say that to, to some of my patients, and it always raises eyebrows. You know, I think in America you refer we you refer to masturbation as jerking off. You know, in Ireland we we call I think we probably use the same term. We call it having a wank. You know. Um, Sometimes in my patients, guys or whatever that I know particularly well, because you have to be careful because we get sued a lot over here too. But you know, often I say to to to, to a patient of mine, I say, "You need to go home and have a wank. You're that God, you're out. that frustrated, you're worked out. Yeah. You know, yeah, you need to go home and have a wank." And I said, "You know, I've had a wank. You know, and when I say that to people, sometimes." They look at me like, you know, oh my God, you, how could you say something like that? You know, but, you know, when I actually come out of the shell of being this doctor who's not supposed to say things like, like that, supposed to, you know, that's not part. You're not going to get many too, too many doctors, you know, you're not, you're not going to meet them and they're not going to ever say to you in a professional capacity, I have masturbated. You know, it, it's just, it's not the thing that's done, you know, because of this, this facade of what the physician and the doctor is and it's very and unfortunately be. that facade should they should be. What, yeah but right, right, they it should, should be. be but whilst it can be whilst it can be very very useful that facade to in, engender a degree of kind of trust in the sense that this guy is higher than me and more important than me therefore i better take the drug that he's given me so and it kind of you know it 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 in, in gender degree of compliance, which can sometimes be good in medical practice, but not all the time, and in fact, you know, rarely. But, but anyway, when you come out, as you said, this notion of becoming a that's what happens to doctors. And that's what happens, I think, to politics, you know, is that they do become the social interface. And that the real human being, the guy who has a smoke, has a wank, cheats on his wife, is, you know, is fat, is overweight, underweight, the real human being disappears a little bit or gets buried. And yeah. then when the public guy, when the public interface or the shell interfaces with another human being, it's kind of like almost like a, a, a cancer or a knock-on effect or a radioisotope effect. It kind of sets off another atom that he has to be kind of superficial and behave in a certain way. We've got everybody going around in kind of official circles like medical circles and polit political circles and everybody is behaving in a certain way and Posture. saying certain things and, and there is again and, and it brings us back to that initial point of having a bit of soul of relaxing and being a human being and not being afraid to be a human being who's foible and who's got foibles and who's got faults and who isn't perfect and you know it, it's that kind of as I said that the bottom kind of notion of status anxiety of where we should be well all of the guys like me and the physicians out there who are wearing the kind of shirt and tie and going about the formal medicine and the holier than thou and pre and the guys driving the Teslas and the super expensive cars, you know, we're all saying to other people in many respects, we're saying to them that, well, your job, your car, all of the shit that you have that may actually be perfectly functional, functional and do the job very well. But we're all saying to them in a quiet sort of a way that I'm better than you. My shit is better than you. And ergo, what you've got and who you are is a little bit more shittier that's now that you've met this public version of me. That social social signaling is something. It's one of those primal things we're all susceptible to. It's why drug dealers can yeah. drive, you know, fancy cars and get all the girls that they want. It doesn't matter how you get your money. And it's also why corporate thieves can get away with, uh, you know, I've got another yacht, so I've got an 18-year-old, 22-year-old girlfriend, you know, on the side. Yeah. Um, but they're all miserable. Most of them are all human beings, so they're all at home and they're either jerking off or having affairs or they're watching porn on the internet or they're sucking down whiskey or snorting coke in the toilet. You know, they're all, they're all, yeah. they're all as screwed up 
as the guy who's got nothing and who's maybe, you know, maybe even just as bad as the guy who's kind of walking around San Francisco, you know, with nowhere to stay, is swinging out of the other end of a bottle. You know, both are perhaps equally screwed up, but one guy happens to have a heap of lot of money to kind of, you know, put on the facade and cushion yeah. and, and pay some bills and that sort of thing. But if in a fundamental way, in a deep sense, you know, there's not a lot. The kind of there should be some sort of a perhaps a, a happiness scale. You know, as I said, nobody comes to the doctor and the doctor can't ask anymore now, or, or maybe he never could. You know, can ask doesn't. We're not asking people, are you happy? Are you unhappy? But you know, that's that should have some kind of social currency instead of the kind of the wealth game that we play. And I'm not saying the wealth game is terribly bad because, as you pointed out. You know, we can't have a completely egalitarian society where everybody's precisely the same. But yeah. if it's all about the money and it's not so much about, you know, your in, innate abilities, whether you sing, whether you listen to Cardi B, whether you dance, whether you got a, another life, you know, aside from that, it's like the thing that will stop us from drifting into these public personas is if we're tethered. We're tethered on to our souls or a bit of soul like, you know, I don't know what you do in your spare time, you know, I mean, I like to write and go cycle and I, I, I go up to the Leitrim and I cycle in the mountains, you know, and I would hope that you've got something that you do when you're not talking to mugs like me and you know, I, 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 do I, the, I do gardening, I do gardening, you're not doing all I, the science, do, you know. I do gardening this year, but I'm also a musician and a songwriter. So I, I, I put out, Fantastic. Uh, yeah, well, this is what I wanted to say. So uh, in, in this change in my career from leaving the University of Pittsburgh and then going into becoming an author and then becoming a, a public scientist. Um, um, as I travel on the circuit and I give speeches and, and talks and, and, you know, lead rallies and so on, I'm just floored at how many people have approached me directly, moms, dads, politicians, doctors, directly human to human right people say do you regret not working at the university of pittsburgh anymore and i said you couldn't pay me enough to go back i would rather take a 50 percent pay cut than what i make right now than to go back there right and and it's not the money it's not it's it's whether people find you that they they approach me and so i respond as my genuine self as well and i think that's the greatest gift that we can give each other is to be our true selves not only to ourselves but to the other people in all contexts, in all settings. And so, you know, when, when I went to New Brunswick and I gave testimony uh, on, on, on why they should think twice about mandating vaccines for everybody in, in the province, the first thing that I said to them was that I, I grew up across the river from you guys, just down the ways in St. Lawrence. And, and you know, I, I know what your life is like a little bit because I wear sandal, socks with my sandals wherever I go. And they understood what I was talking about because it's cold, it, you know, and, and, and it got a great laugh. And it was, I'm, I'm like you, you know, that we're part from, cut from the same cloth. But at the same time, when I went to the Amazon and I was in the Amazon, um, the chief of the Siona Sequoia Indians and I had very similar human moments where we were playing practical jokes on each other. And, and so there's no excuse not to be your authentic self. And, and to, I think this deference that we give to authority, this deference that we give to conformity prevents us from being our true authentic selves. And so the saying, to thy own self be true, is very important because the gift that you want to give to your fellow sojourners in this short thing that we call life is yourself. I've tried to reform myself for academia 12 times over as an undergraduate through grad through three different graduate studies programs, only to wake up at the other end and say, why am I trying to be the jerk that they want me to be? Right? I, I have no choice but to be myself. For me, it was, I can't, I'm not that kind of an actor. I can't pull that crap off. I'm not going to be an asshole just because you think I should. Right? I wouldn't want to be like that a day in my life. And so having that, I don't know, firmament that, that backbone and that spine to stand your stand stand true um where you are is 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 empowering you no know, it, it's independent of finances it's independent of philosophy religion race all of these things it's 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 just bring your best you and that's all that we can ever do 
So, and yes. you certainly did. You certainly did with your resignation, Marcus. You know, it's a position of influence that you had. I hope that you get reappointed after they come to their senses. I hope they come crawling I back to you. I doubt it. I doubt it. They got a. They got a. They got a. Uh, there's a hunting posse out for me. By a lot of my colleagues. Uh, no, I, I. I think. I think once they once they once they, once they sober up, Martin. Uh, once they sober up, Marcus. I think they'll come crawling back to you with an apology, and they should. Yeah. They absolutely should. Because they should say, no, we're going to refuse your resignation. Let's have a meeting about this. But you know the politics better than I do. They, they need to come to their senses. We all need to come to our senses on, on well, ageism. Do, yeah. On ageism and other isms. And, uh, yeah. you know, I want to thank you for being my guest today. It's been a great couple of hours. And um, I'm going to share out your link. And like I said, I'd love to see some more writing. You're exquisitely clear communicator when you write. And we need more people like you. So thanks for being there. Well, thank you very much, Jack and Cher. We'll, we'll, we'll keep in touch. And, uh, yeah, absolutely. And I'll have you back a couple of times. Yeah, we're going to go over a couple of things. Uh, uh, thanks so much. I'm going to sign off now. Thanks, thanks so much.